I have every intention of graduating college, getting a job, and climbing the corporate ladder, and I'm okay with being normal. And I love that. I want everyone to be happy doing whatever they want to do. Normal for me was not happiness. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Minority Mindset Show. Today is going to be a very fun episode because I'm sitting down with somebody who used to be a financial analyst, now is a financial influencer. CNBC has labeled this person as, quote, one of the leading voices for common sense investing and financial literacy. And not just that, he's on a journey of building a multi-million dollar portfolio, which he is sharing with his audience, and he's not even 30 years old. I'm talking about the one and only Austin Hankwitz. Austin, thank you for coming on, man. Dude, I'm so excited for this. Thank you so much for having me. Quick intro, I guess, for sure. Hey, everyone. If you don't know who I am, my name is Austin Hankwitz. I'm 27. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I graduated from the University of Tennessee back in 2018. I got my degree in finance and economics. I graduated to go do mergers and acquisitions for a publicly traded healthcare company. I did that for three-ish years or so, but I had this weird desire to talk about personal finance and investing. We're all familiar with Dave Ramsey, but but weirdly enough, Dave Ramsey came to my high school when I was, I think, 15 or 16 years old to talk about the baby steps. Mm -hmm. So after I learned about like, wait a second, I can invest in something called a Roth IRA. And like, if I just be consistent with it, retire a millionaire, like I was hooked, right? So that's why I went to go study finance. And I had this kind of weird underlying obsession about personal finance and investing all the way till back then. And in 2020, I finally did something about it, right? So New Year's resolution was, I'm gonna make a YouTube video talking about whatever I wanna talk about as it relates to personal finance and investing. And for me at the time, I was trying to build my credit score. I had not yet purchased uh, a real estate property yet. I still had student loans, right? I was a normal 24 year old that is just living his life. And so I was able to uh, make a video online, didn't do too hot. So I said, wait a second, YouTube might not be my thing. Let me pop over to TikTok instead, and the rest is history. So eager to dive into all the details with you, man. This is going to be a really fun episode. Awesome, man. And, and so just for full transparency, where are you on your journey to $2 million? I am right now around the $150,000 mark. So a little bit more about that, right? I realized when I graduated from college and started working my eight, nine, 10 hours a day, like everyone else um, that has a full-time job out of college, that this kind of sucks. You know, I don't really want to do this every single day for the rest of my life. I want to have a goal. I don't want to just be drifting in life and, you know, okay, I do my career and sure, I'll do a little bit of investing here, a little bit of investing there. But, you know, I'll see you guys in 30, 40 years when I'm 65. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to say, okay, you know, here's where I am right now. Here's where I want to be. And I knew that, have you ever heard of the freedom number? No. Okay. So essentially what your freedom number is, is it's how much money you need to have invested oh, in yeah, the yeah. stock market okay. to ensure that you can live and be financially your independent. Yeah, yeah, your wealth number, right? So you can kind of like be financially independent, retire, whatever you want to do there, right? Yeah. So the income produced from that portfolio can offset your monthly expenses. Sure. And so I was like, man, I need to get to my freedom number as soon as possible because I do not want to be doing this, you know, nine to five stuff forever. So the $2 million dividend growth portfolio is a, you know, that, that's my freedom numbers, $2 million, assuming everything sort of stays the same here um, in the markets. But that was what inspired it. You know, I, I wanted to be able to say, how do I build this sort of bridge account, right? Because you know this very well. These retirement accounts we have, if it's a Roth IRA, a 401k, a SEP IRA, if you're self-employed, you can contribute to those and they have tax advantages that come with that. But you don't get to touch those accounts without paying penalties and taxes until you're 59 and a half. And I don't know about the people listening right now, but I don't want to be working until I'm 59 and a half, right? I want to be able to build what I call a bridge account or what this, you know, 2 million dividend growth portfolio is. And I want to be building that throughout my life. So hopefully in the next eight, 10, 12 years, I can achieve this freedom number and, you know, have it spit off if it's, you know, 70, 80, 90, hundred thousand a year in income from this portfolio, depending on what the, you know, dividend yield is. And we can talk more about that, but, um, you know, have it spit off enough where I can live my life and spend the time how I want to spend. It. So by your mid thirties, you'll be essentially retired. That's the goal. That is certainly the goal. And there's a lot of moving parts there, uh, but that, that's certainly the goal. So there's two ways that I want to take this in the beginning of this, this discussion. First, I want to talk about if somebody's watching this, they have little to some money saved, let's say zero to $10,000. How do they go from that to their first 100,000? What are the three to five steps you would recommend for that? And then 
after that, I also want to talk about now for the higher income earners, because we have a lot of people watching this that are your doctors, engineers, executives, sure. making multi six or seven figures a year, wondering what are ways for me to invest my money better? Because I know you have some strategies because you make good money now. Um, and you've come up with some ways of how you can invest money through tax deferred accounts and and kind of get different benefits that way. So let's start with the first, which is now, if somebody, an average person watching this, I work a job, I have zero to $10,000 put away. How do I now go from this to $100,000 as fast as possible? 100%. What a great question. So what I did when I was right out of college working my nine to five, I was making about $63,000, $65,000 a year, which was a great salary. Um, I was taking home every single month around thirty-seven, thirty-eight hundred dollars dollars I had student loans. I had a little bit of credit card debt. I mean, I was the average person. The steps I took were the following. I, one, realized that if I wanted to get somewhere worth going, aka this first $100,000 invested, I needed to be intentional with my money, which means I need to make a budget, right? I, I feel like a lot of people in their 20s and 30s, they might think that they can out earn making a budget or budgets are for poor people or budgets are this or that. You got to get rid of that mindset. Having a budget, in my opinion, is the permission to spend money on things that matter most to you. And so I made that budget. The budget, obviously, like everyone else's budget, you know, you got the groceries, utilities, the rent, the this and that. But more importantly, it's once you figured out what you're spending and what that margin is in your budget, what you're doing with the margin, right? And so to your point, let's say this person has zero to $10,000. Maybe they've, you know, found the margin. They've been able to pay off any high interest debt, if that's credit cards, personal loans loans, you know, uh, IRS debt, whatever that might be. Um, and they've perhaps been able to build that first three to six months of expenses, which are also really important because if you don't have a little bit of cushion between you and life and life does happen, then you revert back to the credit card as sort of a, a crutch, right? You know, you don't want to do that. So let me ask you a question here. So let's just say somebody's making $5,000 a month after taxes. Mm -hmm. How much now should they spend versus invest versus save versus pay down debt? Because there's a lot of different moving parts to even that budget part how, what does somebody look for? Well, I mean, we've all heard of the 50, 30, 20 rule, right? 50% goes towards, so 50% of that 5,000, 2,500 goes towards your needs, 30% goes to wants, and 20% goes to saving and investing. I think that's a fine general outline, but I really want to encourage people listening right now. I mean, they follow you for a reason. They're smart. I really want to encourage people listening right now to be as intentional with your money as possible. I mean, what I simply do every single month to start in, you know, I use uh, an app called Copilot. I've used Mint. I've used Every Dollar. I've used all these different uh, budgeting apps in the past, but I want people to be really intentional with this money. So they have this $5,000. The, the first thing you need to be thinking about is what are the things I absolutely have to pay every single month to exist and go to work and make money, right? So I need to have my rent. I need some decent groceries. I need some you know, utilities, Wi-Fi, stuff like that, my phone. Um, I need reliable transportation. I'm not getting too extravagant with it, right? I don't have a crazy car payment. But it's it's kind of how I, I, I tried to break things up uh, back in the day and still do today, which is your fixed expenses and your very variable expenses. If you can figure out what your fixed expenses every single month are, and you can predict those, then you can now say, okay, I know that I'm going to earn or take home X amount of dollars over the next 12 months. So all of 2024, I'm going to have, you know, this is going to be my take home salary because you, you already know what your paycheck is. You can multiply it by 26. So if you get paid every two weeks or 24, if you get paid twice a month. You know, what you're, you know what you're taking home. You know now exactly how much is going to get paid out to your fixed expenses, which means, wait a second, I now have this extra whatever that number is every single month or throughout the year of 2024 to my variable expenses. Now, you those variable expenses might be eating out. It might be vacation. It might be this and that. But these are things that don't exactly, you have you don't exactly have to spend money on these things to survive, go to work, do your stuff at, at, you know, throughout your normal job. So for the person who's trying to go from zero to 10K to that first 100K, they have to know where the margin is in their budget, which are, are the variable expenses, and be very intentional with, okay, am I maxing out my Roth IRA every year, right? Because that's very important, right? The goal here is to get $100,000, as, as we know, the first 100K invested in the markets. That's when compound interest really begins to do its work. So if we're taking the easy steps here, you know, obviously Dave Ramsey says match beats Roth beats traditional. I largely agree with that. 
some people listening right now might not have a match from a 401k, right? Uh, you know, an employer here. So if that's the case, then go straight to that Roth IRA. That's $7,000 this year. But you're saying, wait a second. Okay. I've got my, my, my let's say they're doing the, the 7,000. Let's say they're also doing maybe the 20 or 23,000 that's going on with the 401k. And maybe they've got an extra five or 10 grand left over. That's sort of what I've begun to say and, and start taking like, wait a second, I'm using my extra money to begin putting it in a traditional taxable brokerage account that can generate me income. And the reason why that's so important is because you know these other retirement accounts, again, you can't touch them until you're 59 and a half. But if I can have this account be a very specific theme or strategy to it, and it can generate income for me, I can then take that income, reinvest it back into that or use that. And maybe the income I generate here will be how I max out my Roth IRA the next year. I've got a couple strategies and ideas um, you know, on ways that I do that, but uh, so I'm before sure we yeah, jump into that, yeah. so I want to clarify. So you're saying step number one is create a budget, yes. understand where your money is going. Number two, it sounds like looking at your variable expenses and being very mindful about them, maybe Absolutely. cutting back on some of these expenses. Then number three is maximizing your investments, mm -hmm. things like your um, IRA, 401ks, Roth, traditionals, whatever put them into these traditional investment accounts. Are those the three steps that you would say then for somebody to get started to get to that hundred thousand? I would. And, you know, I, th I think a mistake a lot of people make, and I made this mistake myself too, right, is I, and I, you know, this isn't a dig at, at a Dave Ramsey or someone who wants to like, you know, get as many people out of debt as possible. But a good example of this is my girlfriend, right? She's 25 years old. I'm 27. She's got $36,000, $37,000 of student loan debt. She's the average American right now. And Despite having thirty six, thirty seven thousand dollars of student loan debt, she is still making an effort to max out her Roth IRA this year. Well, wait a second. I, oh, I, we can't out invest high interest debt. Why is she? That's true, but student loan debt's around four percent interest rate, so it's nothing too crazy there. But I guess I'm trying to say is I'd much rather have seven thousand dollars working for me in an account that I can't touch for let's call it. 35 years. So compound interest, at least that first 7,000 is probably going to turn into assuming seven to 10% annual returns. You know, the market doubles every seven years. That's probably close to 40 or $50,000 versus putting that 7,000 and trying to pay off the student loans or the, 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 lo the low interest debt, right? We're not talking about credit cards. We're not talking about very bad debt. There's a difference there. But I think that's a mistake a lot of folks make in their 20s and maybe even early 30s is, I don't know if I should start investing yet. I don't know if I need to get money in the markets just yet because I still have this thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar of student loan debt, or or this uh, you know low interest debt hanging over my head that I want to knock out first. It's very important to get rid of that. However, I do think that there it's not so black and white. So you're you're saying that if somebody wants to build wealth sooner, if you have these low interest debts, consider investing before necessarily just only paying down these low interest debts. And what about like? Uh, using something like, so you're saying your girlfriend's debt is around 4%. What about if you can get a high interest savings account at say 5%, taking the money you would have put, put into the 5%, taking the difference, right? That extra 1% margin and using that to pay down the student loan debt more aggressively. Is that something that you would uh, say is a good? Yeah. I would, I mean, math, the math checks out there. Um, I, you know, I'm sure a lot of people listening right now would also be like, wait a second, that's a lot of work. I don't know if I can actually do that, right? It's so funny. We just made an episode on my podcast, Rich Habits, about uh, the three biggest financial mistakes to avoid in 2024. And one of them was borrowing from your 401k because, I mean, let's all face it here. Borrowing from your 401k, if done correctly, nothing bad happens to the balance of your 401k. You borrow yeah. the money, you pay it back, all's good. But like 80% of the time, people don't do that correctly. It's, yeah. it's the kind of shrug it off. And so to your point of like this sort of, you know, arbitrage on my money, I'm all here for it, right? Yeah. The math checks out. If you know how to do that and if you can be disciplined with that, that's uh, the it factor there. I like that. Well, I'm, I'm going to go back to something, maybe take a little twist here. So uh, your girlfriend, you said, has about $36,000 in student loan debt in a relationship. How important are these conversations about money and how important is like... You are clearly on this wealth building journey that you've been very conscious about how you use your money, pay down your debts, and invest your money to build this you know, multi-million dollar portfolio that you've been very open with. So I'm sure your wife or your girlfriend knows. Mm -hmm. So I guess what types of conversations do you have with her about money? 
We have money conversations every single month. I mean, that was probably one of the earliest. And are they uncomfortable? They're not. They're, they're not. And I think that's, I just got so lucky with her. Um, you know, she is, it's so funny. We met uh, on TikTok, weirdly enough. Um, she was following <laughs> wow. me back in the day to try and learn about investing and, yeah, and yeah. debt payoff and, you know, personal finance in general. So this was also something that she had already had, you know, an underlying, um, you know, desire to learn more about. And so, you know, it just flourished in our relationship as we began talking about these things. But, you know, I think having conversations about money in any relationship is very important. And obviously we know the, what is it? The divorce rate, uh, number one reason for divorce is, is money and, and money disputes. But conversations we have every single month, uh, we make a budget. We say, for example, you know, we did no spend January. We're filming this, I think it's January 22nd today. Um, we did no spend January, which means, hey, her name's Ireland. I was like, hey, Ireland, let's do no spend January. Um, I really want to just, you know, we've spent a lot of money with Christmas, this and that. I just want a, a reset month where I, uh, let me see what I really need, you know, the fix versus the variable. I'm just kind of reset myself here in 2024. And so being able to be with someone that you can say, hey, I don't want to go out to eat. I don't want to go on big dates this month. I don't want to plan this. I don't want to do that. Let's stay home. Let's cook it. You know, let's do these specific things and then be like, okay, cool. That sounds cool. Like, yeah. let's do it. Right. They like you for you, not for your, the experiences that you can afford them. Um, that's super, super important. So if somebody now is in a relationship already, maybe they're dating or they're married and they're not on the same page financially, what should they do? Because I think that this is a very common thing. Like, let's say, you know, you get married, you're young. Yeah. Now you start having kids. And at some point it's like, I want to get financially educated. I want to become wealthy. And clearly what we've done in the past has not been working. So now one person says, we need to change our financial habits. The other person is still in the, let's spend money, let's have a good time. Who cares about credit card debt? How do you now combat this? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, and, you know, luckily, Ireland and I haven't been able, you know, haven't had to, to, to have those conversations. But I did just talk to a friend. Um, I think it was on Tuesday or Wednesday, Wednesday of last week. He came over to, to hang out. And he just turned 30 years old. He's a fireman here in the in, in Nashville. And his girlfriend is a couple years younger, call it 27 or 28. And they are now trying to have those conversations before marriage, and they are not seeing eye to eye. He's making, call it $55,000 a year. He has no debt. Uh, he paid off his truck. He's got no credit card debt. He's starting to invest to his retirement. He's getting really uh, you know, focused on that while his girlfriend is 27, 28. She has $150,000 of student loan debt. She is a doctor of physical therapy, which is really, really cool. But she, in in his uh, from from his perspective, um, she still wants to you know kind of keep pushing that down the down the road. Doesn't really care about investing or things like this. She wants to live for the Instagram, live for the the Instagram yeah. stories and, and the highlights there, right? And uh, the advice I gave him was math is a good place to start. You know, at the end of the day, um, it's really hard to argue with the math. So if you can sit down with someone and have a, a civil conversation and say, listen, here's where we are today. And this is how much, because we did ABC, XYZ on our credit cards, here's how much we had to pay in interest last month on this debt. And if we continue to do this, this is uh, projected how much we'll have to pay in interest on this debt throughout the year of 2024. So perhaps that's something that we should consider. You know, And it's not just calling out the problems, but also offering solutions, right? I mean, it's really hard to want to have a conversation with someone that's always saying, you're doing this wrong, this is wrong, or this is wrong, this is wrong, versus, hey, we are doing this wrong because we are together on this. And here's a solution I think we need to partake in. And here's how I'm going to change my habits or my lifestyle today to try and achieve this solution. Um, here's what I propose perhaps you could also do, but I'm open to hear any you know different uh, opinions you might have about a solution here. So I think just you know putting it on the table, trying to have some some real math heavy conversations here, uh, very logic based in nature, and uh, you know starting from that perspective, and, and again not just calling out the problems, but also working toward a solution is probably yeah. a, the first step I'd say. And it's very interesting. Uh, you know, there's a a lot of kind of science and, and research that's kind of put into this into the minds of men versus women. Yeah, great book on this called Men Are from Mars. Women are from Venus, and one of the things that they highlighted is that men think very logically, uh, women tend to think more emotionally. And what that means now is, you know, if, if we talk about it from a perspective of a money conversation, it's a little bit easier to talk to a man about money with logic. That's just kind of the way the men's brains are wired versus women's brains are a little bit more emotionally wired. 
which means that sometimes, you know, some relationships will be different. But in the general, if you want to get a female, a woman to understand more about money, you, it might be better to take more of an emotional approach of understanding how this could help us be a stronger family and, and kind of the emotional side. So that might be something to consider as well. You're, what you said earlier is 100% right, that money issues are one of the leading causes of divorce. And one of the most difficult parts, and this could be in a relationship, this is in business, is the communication side. Because what causes relationships to fail isn't necessarily that we're not on the same page about money, it's that we don't understand how to be on the same page. Because if I tell you, like if you're in a hypothetical relationship, I'm like, you're spending too much money, it's an attack on you. right? And and you feel like as opposed to us working towards the same goal that we're fighting each other trying to do something. It's the same thing in business. If you can't communicate your business's goals or missions or or whatever it is that you're trying to do with the team, part of the team's going to say, no, we don't want to do that. Like if we talk about going back into the office, you know, because that's a big thing in 2024. If you say, we need to go back into the office because we need to be more productive, what happens? Half of the team or more of the half the team says, screw you, that's stupid. And some percentage of the team says, yeah, we need to succeed. Well, when you have two different factions on anything, whether it's a business or relationship or whatever, creates tension, it creates difficulty and it makes it very hard for that thing to succeed. So I really like what you said about that. Now you have been creating a lot of content online and uh, you're 27. And I want to talk about this briefly because uh, a general ballpark, how much money are you generating from the content that you're producing on TikTok, social media podcasts and all that? Yeah. So when I started making content back in March of 2020, I came from the perspective of, hey, I'm 24 years old. I sure I have this degree, you know, I have a cool job, but I'm learning. I'm 24. I'm not an expert. I'm not, you know, a, a, a bald headed uh, Dave Ramsey, right? I'm not a guy who's been here for 40 years. Um, He's and so, pretty much your neighbor out here in Nashville. I know he really is. Um, but you know, I'm not an expert. I'm a guy learning. And that was sort of the parasocial relationship I wanted to form with my audience was I'm going to try things. I'm going to try different investing techniques and strategies. I'm going to be doing things with my money. Uh, and I'm going to try and figure out and if it works for me, I'm going to share it. If it doesn't work for me, I'm going to share it. I'm going to be transparent and authentic the whole way through. And if you learn something, you know, let's try and learn stuff together here because I'm not a, you know, expert mentor. I'm instead the older brother that you might have never had. That's like, I yeah, dude, that. I tried that. Don't do that, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I started making videos about uh, personal finance and investing in March of 2020. And I immediately was inspired by what Andre Jick did, which was creating a Patreon community, right? A, a way for you to really, you know, make build a community around your audience that, you know, who are these super fans? And so I was like, wait a second, do th people really like, like want to pay me to tune in to a, like a, a daily live stream I can do? Or like, would people really care to like hear what I have to say about stuff like that? Or like, you know, write a newsletter and turns out they did. So um, that was actually the first way I was able to monetize as a content creator was Patreon. And I had, um, I think I peaked around 2000 um, patrons that were paying me between, I think it was $4 was like, buy me a beer. And like $39 was like, you get access to like the live streams and, and, and behind per the, month per month. Yeah. And so that averaged about eighteen to twenty thousand dollars back in the day. And how old were you then? Uh, twenty four, still twenty five. So twenty four, twenty five, making about eighteen, twenty thousand a month. I was, yeah, and I was quarter still, million a year. Yeah, and I was still working my full time job. I was like, this is because it was so funny too. I made I made the uh, realization. I was like, wait a second, I just spent nine hours today building these Excel models for a company that pays me. 3,800 bucks a month after taxes. If I spent that same nine hours trying to, you know, make better content for these people who are already paying me money, like I bet I could even, you know, they'll tell their friends about it and I could get even more people. And I was like, and I'm making like 10 times as much. This is so cool. <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, but so the business I have today is uh, sort of four different pillars. The first one is being a content creator, right? Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, there are companies like, uh, for example, uh, public.com. I've been working with public.com. They're an online broker. Uh, I've been working with them since I think April or May of 2020. I'm a customer. I'm a user. I'm an advocate. I love what they do. They have a great platform. And uh, I am frequently compensated to make content on their behalf and for them to sponsor uh, different types of piece of content that I'm publishing, right? So- um, And this the, primarily on TikTok, would you say? I would say TikTok and yeah, TikTok and my newsletter for sure. 
So um, the, the, the TikTok there and the money that's generated from the sponsorships is the first pillar. The second pillar that still has a lot to do with uh, being a, a, just a straight up content creator is I have a newsletter called Rate of Return. We have 13,000 uh, total subscribers, about I think now closer to 650 uh, of those are paid subscribers. They pay $13 a month. They get access to my $2 million dividend growth portfolio. I host weekly live streams. I do a um, market recap every Sunday. So every Monday I do something called the Invest week ahead, which are all the earnings to expect. This is very uh, sophisticated investor vibes, right? So if you're yeah. a nerd like me, you're going to like this stuff. But it's uh, the earnings calls to expect that week, the economic you know, uh, reports that are coming out, the different types of investor relation events that are happening. So me and my co-author, Christian Blackwell, we write this out every single Monday. And then on Sunday, we go back and say, okay, here are the things that happened. And here's what I'm doing differently now with my money, if at all, uh, because these things happened, right? So um, this week, we've got earnings from you know Tesla and Netflix. So on Sunday, I'll, you know, make the breakdown. This is what happened with Tesla's earnings. Yeah. Netflix is, it's, it's really cool. So that newsletter is about 100,000, 110,000 a year business, uh, which is awesome. And, uh, oh, and then I, I, what is it? The TikTok, uh, I would say that business is um, probably close to probably the same 100 to 150,000. So between the TikTok sponsorships and the uh, newsletter, it's about, let's call it 250 or $300,000 sure. uh, creator business. The other two pillars of this, um, one is a new pillar, which is the Rich Habits podcast. We We've been able to, alongside Robert Croak, I was able to launch a podcast about personal finance, uh, business, mindset, entrepreneurship. And Robert Croak is the co-founder of... Uh, he is the founder. The of, founder. Of Silly Bands. Silly Bands. Yeah, those cool uh, elastic... The amazing um, viral sensation that no kidding, made a dude. lot of money. So literally hundreds of millions of dollars. It was unbelievable. But um, I found him uh, on TikTok, funny enough, last February. And I was like, hey man, you've got some pretty pretty cool stuff to say. <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, thanks, you too. And I was like, we just kind of like a, a So you good, just reach out to him. Yeah, cold. I just shot him a DM on TikTok. And I was like, hey dude, like would love to share. The Let's power see. of social media. Oh man, it's so beautiful. And I think a lot of people make this mistake. I get DMs all the time, right? Um, you know, we got connected uh, over email, but you know, I get DM'd from a lot of people for whatever reason. And it's always, hey man, do you have 10 minutes I could pick your brain? Or hey man, can you oh, answer yeah. this question for me? Yeah. And I'm like, ah, oh, dude, like, come on. That's your opening word with Robert. And I was like, hey Robert, love your content. Uh, I've worked as a content creator for three years now. I'd love to hop on a call and share what's worked for me, share my learnings, and perhaps learn you know what you're working on as well. Say so like, let me share with you. Let me provide you value up front. Yeah. And so you know, knowing that's just like what you do as as a nice person. And so we hopped on a call and, and we did. Just, he respond to the first message. He did. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow. Okay. And so um, we just hopped on a call, had a you know good conversation, and I was like, man, we just talked about a lot of really cool things. He's like, yeah, we did. And I was like we should have recorded that. That could have been like a cool podcast episode for our audience to listen to. He's like, dude, we should make a podcast. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's do I love it. That. Yeah. And so uh, we, you know, we, we, started the Rich Habits podcast. We hit number one on Spotify's business charts Amazing. after just 25 episodes. Amazing. Um, October was when we peaked at number one. I think we're a top five, top six right now on Spotify uh, as well. Yeah, surpassed like Dave Ramsey. We surpassed Morning Brew. We surpassed Patrick wow. Bet David. All these, you know, 80, 90,000 weekly listeners here on the podcast, uh, which is really, really cool. So that business segment uh, or podcasting in general, because as a, I'm talent actually for a iHeartMedia podcast called uh, Mind the Business, Small Business Success Stories. Um, so they pay me to be a co-host there. I'm also talent for a Seeking Alpha podcast uh, called Investing Experts. So podcasting as like a bucket of my business is probably a three to 400 $50,000 a year business, just depending on, I guess, advertisers and, and things like that. Um, and the other, call it 50%, 60% of the business comes from uh, marketing consulting. So a lot of companies, specifically fintechs, have no idea how to tell the story of their business in a way that's going to make retail investors excited to learn more. And as a content creator since March of 2020, I've figured out how to articulate myself and tell a story um, as to what I'm doing that makes people want to tune in more. Um, so if I can take what I've learned there and help a company like Public or Money Lion or you know these other fintech companies like Charles Schwab and Fundrise and um, you know insert company here, Masterworks is another one. Um, you know these different companies that want to tell a story, want to sell a product, want to introduce people to what they're offering as a fintech. They come to me and my business partner Christian, and not only can I be the talent, but I can also be the strategy around the distribution, who other creators we can get involved. You know, I'll help them spend their marketing budgets. We spent a quarter million dollar marketing budget for Charles Schwab uh -huh. uh, in 2022, which was so much fun. 
but it was about this new product that they were offering around uh, like, you know, your first hundred dollars invested in the markets. And so, you know, and, and what's so important about this too is a, a lot of these marketing departments in these companies say, okay, cool, we're going to pay a content creator a couple thousand dollars, they're going to make a video and we're just going to do this all on TikTok. And it's like, okay, that's kind of a good idea. But did you know that content creator also has a newsletter, a discord, and they are, you know, they have a podcast as well. And they're like, Oh no, we just thought they were just on, you know, TikTok. It's like maybe instead of trying to just sell your product to one side of their audience segment, you should holistically look at the creator as a human being and in their entire creator business and say, let's kind of do a, a you know, a, just a 100% sponsorship across, you know, if it's TikTok, their podcast, maybe you can do something on their Discord or their Twitter or, you know, their newsletter as well. Then their audience would really start, oh, wait a second, he really likes this or she really yeah. likes this company. I really need to give it a try, right? And so that in itself was a, a big, in Silver Moraine's a, a really big part of our, our business is, you know, we do this marketing consulting and and that has evolved uh, actually uh, away from just fintech companies, but also now we have a partnership with the New York Stock Exchange. We are their preferred marketing providers wow. for every time a ETF lists on the NYSE, um, we get an intro to their marketing department. Really? And, and the ETF says, hey guys, we want to build awareness and education for our ETF. So ProShares uh, is a good example yeah. of this. They came out with an equal weight Bitcoin, Ethereum ETF. They say, we have no idea how to get people to care about what we just released on the markets here. What do we do? And so we consult them, help them strategize on what that looks like. Um, we do this for Global X, iShares, uh, a bunch of these really cool, massive, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, S&P Global, hundreds of billions of dollars of invested assets, uh, AUM uh, companies, which is, yeah. well, that was a, a latter half of 23 thing, but it's going to be a really big part of, I think, our business in 24. Wow. And how much is that generating for you? I would say um, anywhere between half a million to 800,000 a year. Wow. How did you get connected with the New York Stock Exchange? I mean, that's uh, very impressive. Dude, it was so funny. So I was on the front page of Bloomberg September of 21 as one of these like Finfluencers. Um, you know, anyway, but I caught the attention of an incredibly smart and charismatic woman named Katie Stockton. Everyone go check out Katie Stockton. She is a CNBC personality who specifically focuses on technical analysis. So I do the fundamental analysis. I love looking at the income statement, the balance sheet, yeah. the, you know, cash flow statement, things of that nature. She likes looking at the charts, the volumes, the all the things I have no idea about, right? So I always learn something when I talk to her. But she is very well tied in with, um, you know, Wall Street and and all the people over there. And so she actually launched her own ETF called TAC. T-A-C-K is the ticker. And essentially it, it uses a couple of different types of um, technical analysis uh, indicators to figure out which of the, um, I think I think it's eight uh, different sectors of the market that she wants to invest into is like the best. And it's very interesting. Go check that out to learn more. But long story short, um, she got to ring the opening bell um, in 2022. And I got to meet a guy named Mo Sparks who worked at the NYSE. Um, and Mo was like, And what hey, is man. the NYSE? New York Stock Exchange. Okay. Yeah. So he worked at the NYSE and he was like, hey man, uh, this is some really cool stuff you know, you're doing with Katie. Like, let's just be friends. And so became friends with him and he introduced us to his boss and then his boss. And then it turned into a, a really cool relationship now where they realize like, wait a second, this Austin and Christian guy, like they're really good at, you know, articulating, a, you know, building awareness and articulating what a complex financial product on the surface might actually mean for a retail investors portfolio if they actually knew what was going on behind the scenes. So it's uh, it's been an incredible partnership and we're really grateful. So now you have these four pillars yeah. of your business, brand, company that are making, say, a lot of money. Sure. And what now, I would say, what advice would you give to somebody else who's, say, a high-income employee or a high-income earner? How can they now take their money and what are you doing to build that wealth strategically and potentially uh, tax-free because, you know, when you're a high-income earner, you got a big tax bill. Oh my gosh. And so now the question is, what do you do to keep more of that money and grow more of that money and grow it quickly? That way you can build your wealth sooner. So I'm not a tax professional. Go consult a tax professional, please. And I wish I knew more secrets to, um, you know, being able to reallocate funds to, to not have to pay taxes on that. Um, I'll pay six figures of taxes for 23. I mean, it was <laughs> disgusting. But um, well, it means you made a lot of money. Sure, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so 
a couple things I do to maximize my investing, my retirement, to make sure that I'm being strategic here. Number one is there's a company called carrymoney.com. Uh, if you know Ankur Nagpal, he was the co-founder of Teachable, which is uh, a really cool website that allows um, you know content creators to host master classes and courses. Uh, he sold that company for I think it was like three hundred million dollars during 2020, and he took his uh, slice of that pie and, and went to go create uh, Carry Money, which essentially is if you are self-employed and you are a business owner, a small business owner, they are going to make it so simple for you to open up the first, you know, solo 401k, the mega backdoor solo Roth 401k, the SEP IRA, like, like they're going to do everything for you behind the scenes. And it is just a flat fee per month you, or per year you pay them. Um, I've been using them out for two years. They are so, so convenient. So what I've done is I max out my mega backdoor solo Roth 401k. I have to like think about it for a second because that's such a long name. But uh, can, you, can you explain what that means? Sure, sure. So Essentially, think about it like this. If you are employed by you know your employer, you have your uh, 401k, and I think it's now $23,000, $24,000 uh, every year here to invest that you can uh, you know deploy toward that, and that's going to max out your 401k for the year. If it's a traditional 401k, that $24,000, because uh, it is going to be you know the profits you earn uh, in retirement throughout that invested time, you know, in the markets here, you're going to pay taxes in the future, which means you don't have to pay taxes on that now. So, I'm so sure if I make a hundred thousand, I put $20,000 into my traditional 401k, right? That means that's 20,000 that I don't pay taxes on today. Correct. And let's call it a 30% tax bracket. So you save $6,000 on your tax bill this year because you invested to this account. And, but you know, when you're 65 and you want to enjoy that money, um, you have to pay taxes on the money you pull out as income, sure. right? So, so if that 20 grows to a hundred, if I pull out a hundred, I pay taxes on all hundred. Exactly. When I'm older. Exactly. Um, so you've got the, uh, Mega Backdoor Solo Roth 401k, which a lot is of words. a lot of words. Let's keep that 401k kind of idea here in mind in that same account. So your employer, you got that going on over there. I don't have an employer. I am my employer. Mm -hmm. So the solo 401k is a way for me as a self-employed individual to go to my entity. It's an S-corp, right? It's an LLC taxes and S-corp. I can go to my entity and say, hey, open up this uh, solo 401k in the eyes of the IRS, and I'm going to now contribute just like I do the 23,000 over here, but I'm going to do it to my own sort of company entity here. So just like that, I'm going to have my $23,000 in my solo 401k. And what I choose to do is the Roth version. So I want to do everything after taxes because I want to make sure that when I'm in retirement and I have my millions, I don't want to pay taxes. I, I don't <laughs> even know what the tax brackets are going to be, you know, in the future. We yeah. had like 90% tax brackets back, you know, and just recently too. Like it was, I think it was in the 60s or 70s, right? It's very weird. So if I can pay taxes now, I'm going to do that, get it over with and have all my millions uh, later then. But maybe someone wants to do the opposite. They want to cut their tax brackets, right? They want to pay less uh, in taxes today. You can can actually do the same mega backdoor solo Roth or solo 401k rather, no Roth there. And I think it's $69,000 in 2024 that you can take from your um, business account. You can put it into this account and you can write off $69,000 off of your business, which is unbelievable because- But you I still mean, have to pay the taxes in the you, future. You will have to pay them in the future. That is correct. Um, but if you don't want to pay, what would that be? Call it 18 ish, 15, 18 thousand dollars in taxes this year. That's a really good way for a self employed individual to save some money. Um, now, kind of back to someone who might not be self employed and they are working, they're making a bunch of money. Um, like a doctor, like a doctor, yeah, engineer, software engineer, absolutely, executive, 100%. So, there are different ways that I have friends. I have, a, I have a lawyer friend here in Nashville. He has um, been leaning into real estate as the way that he can try and uh, you know, d reduce his tax bill. I think there's a, a bunch of different, uh, if it's depreciation, I know you can do bonus depreciation with a cost segregation analysis. There's a bunch of different ways in real estate. I don't have experience in that. I have a normal rental property I bought uh, in 2019 and it's just doing its thing. I, I haven't done anything crazy with it there yet. But what I would encourage these people to do is take as much of this money that you have that is not allocated, you've got your variables, you got your fixed, and you've got seven, eight, ten thousand dollars left over, put it to work so that it can passively make you income. Money that is sitting in a savings account or a checking account or just it's it's not actually put to work is dead money. 
I hate dead money. I want all of my money to be making me more money. Where are like three to five places somebody can take 10 grand and generate passive income? So there are two ways, in my opinion, even before that, I want people to be thinking about making their money work for them. Mm -hmm. The first way is you can have that money generate you income or you can have that money generate you potential capital appreciation. Two examples. One, to the generate income, we all know dividend ETFs and dividend stocks, right? The dividends they pay, money deposited to our checking or our, our uh, brokerage accounts, but we can, you know, And, use and just that. define what is the stock versus the ETF? Yeah. So um, a stock is a company like a Lowe's, a Home Depot, a Costco. It's publicly traded on the U.S. stock market. These are companies who are obviously uh, want to make a profit. They want to share these profits with their shareholders. And so as a investor into this company, you will be a shareholder that they want to make profits for. Um, an ETF is a basket of these types of stocks. So think about it as... Um, um, just a bunch of stocks put together in a basket and the and the price of that ETF moves up and down with the underlying value of those stocks. So ETFs have different themes. You can have, you know, a theme of uh, VGT, for example, is the Vanguard Information Technology ETF. It's very popular and it's all the big technology names we know and love like Amazon and Google and Salesforce, yeah. right? Uh, there's also AI specific ETFs like AIQ. Um, but for me specifically, what I'm looking at are the income producing ETFs. So I use covered call income producing ETFs to do that. There are uh, really, there's one that I use religiously. It is by the Neos Funds crew over there. It's called SPYI. This ETF, it is absolutely a game changer. It came out, I think it was August of 2022. And I don't think enough people are talking about it. Explain to me, what, what do you mean by covered call uh, dividend or income producing ETF. I got you. So as someone who wants to use seven, ten, twelve thousand dollars, this extra money, and, and you don't have to have ten thousand dollars to start. You can be, you know, anyone you want here. Um, but it's what I use myself and because I want income. What this ETF does is they say, okay, we are going to aim to track the total performance of the S and P 500. The S and P 500, for those listening right now, are 500 of the largest and most profitable publicly traded companies in the United States. If it is a cool company like a Disney or a Target or a Costco, like you, you like any company you can think of, it's probably in the S and P 500, right? And as we know, the S and P 500 has had a historical return over the last 80 or 90 years now of about eight and a half, nine percent when adjusted for inflation. It is the benchmark for investing um, as, as an investor. And so what this ETF does is they say, our goal is to ensure that the total return, which is not just price appreciation, but also dividends paid to investors, reflects upon the total return that the actual index uh, generated for uh, its investors throughout the same period of time. So what this ETF cares about is income. So what they do is they sell option contracts against their holdings of the S&P 500 because they invest all the money people come in in the same weighting. It's all the S&P 500 and they sell option contracts against those holdings to generate premium. And that premium is then paid out to their investors every single month in the form of a distribution. And they average a 12% annual distribution, which means 1% every month. It's very predictable. So let's break that down a little bit more. Sure. That, that, uh, Still is, I think, a little complex. So It very much is. Let's explain what an option contract is. Can you explain what that yeah. is? Yeah. So an option contract is essentially saying, hey, I've got 100 shares. Actually, I, I sell options against my Tesla stock, covered call option contracts, which is exactly what this company does. So let me explain it in Tesla stock terms. Sure. And then it should be able to uh, kind of translate a little bit better here. So I bought 100 shares of Tesla stock at about 260 bucks a share uh, late last year. And I said, hey, if anyone wants to buy these 100 shares of Tesla stock from me for $265 a share, so more than I bought them for, mm -hmm. I will let you do that and you have five weeks to buy it from me, right? So there's a specific price I will sell them at, and there's a specific day that you have to buy them from me before. So mm -hmm. that price is called the strike price, and the day is called the expiration date. Mm -hmm. So the strike price stays the same throughout the duration of the contract. And once the deadline hits on that expiration date, if your stock price is not above the strike price, 
you keep all the premium that that person paid you for the right to buy your stock at that price. So yeah. here's a very clear numbers example. 260 is what I paid for Tesla stock, right? So that's $26,000 that went, was out of my pocket. I said, if anyone wants to buy these from me for $265 a share, so I'd profit $500 by selling them for more than I bought them for, mm -hmm. you can do that before, I think it was October 25th of 2023. I bought them and I did this contract on September 12th. So I gave it five weeks. Mm -hmm. I was paid $1,500 in premium income from someone on the internet. Um, I was paid $1,500 upfront for that. Yeah. So that $1,500, when you think about 100 shares that are being kind of traded here, it's $15 mm -hmm. per share. So if the strike price was $265 and the cost of the purchaser paid me an extra 15 per share, that means if the Tesla stock was above $280 yeah. by the expiration date, they would want to exercise their right to purchase it sure. at 265 and they would you know make a profit they'd arbitrage the profit there so if it was at 400 bucks a share yeah and they could buy it for 280 adjusted then heck yeah they're going to want to do that right so essentially it's a form of trading where you have it for 260 this person may or may not want to invest in tesla and so what they say is i'm going to give you 1500 dollars, and this 1500 dollars i'm giving you as a payment is money to you, but it gives me the right mm -hmm. to purchase your stock for two sixty five. Right, and so now if that price of the Tesla stock goes above two eighty because it's two sixty five that I have to pay you plus yeah. the extra fee, if it goes above two eighty, I'm going to make a profit. If it falls to let's just say two hundred dollars a share. I'm going to lose money, but I don't actually own the stock. So I only lose the $1,500 that exactly. they gave you. Exactly. So it's a form of trading is what you're trying to say, right? That uh, if it goes above, if I think it's going to go above 280, I'm going to just give you this extra fee. And then all the additional profits above 280 are mine. Is that correct? That is correct. In the eyes of the person that's buying it from me, right? right. As someone who owns the stock, I obviously don't want it to go up there. I want to keep this guy's right. money, right? You want the money. Exactly. And so- And keep the stock. And keep the stock, which I've done for the last four months now is I've generated $4,050 doing this with Tesla. And I have also kept all 100 shares of the stock, which is great. Um, and we can talk more about- But if, you know, the if they do there. end up taking it, you still walk away with a profit. That is so true. a win-win for you. And what people don't talk about too is rolling the position, right? So- like, let's say it, you know, I've got a 265 strike price and let's say Tesla did go up to 300 bucks or something, right? So something very, you know, they'd want to exercise this contract. I can roll my contract forward, which essentially buys and sells on the same time in Robinhood. It's very cool how they do this, but they make it so, okay, your expiration date is February 15, 2024. You can roll that forward now to May 15, 2024 and crank up the strike price up uh -huh. to $350. So as long as it's not trading above $350 before that May 15 deadline, then you can still keep the stock. So that's what I plan to do if it ever gets real close to the yeah. uh, strike price here. I've had to kind of roll the strike price up and down uh, and roll the expiration date forward uh, throughout the volatility of Tesla that we've seen uh, recently. But so if you roll it forward now, if somebody is you know taking the option, they want to buy it from you, for 280 right and then it goes to 290 you're saying you can roll the strike price forward yes but what does that mean for the buyer then like somebody who's who's executing that option so what mean so so robin hood does it in such a way where you have to because if you want to change the contract you have to buy yourself out of the contract mm. so what you do is one you buy yourself out of the contract so that's a debit to your account that's money that comes out of your account but simultaneously, you're also doing another covered call into the future. Mm -hmm. And the credit of the covered call in the future is more than the debit in real time to buy yourself out of the contract. So no real money leaves my brokerage account like buying power there. Mm -hmm. I actually get a credit to it because I'm rolling it forward, oh. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely. It's a... Robinhood's figured all that stuff out, man. It's pretty yeah, interesting. It gets much more complex. So now what you're saying, if we go back up a little bit, is you're investing into an ETF. So you're yes. not actually doing this in the, the your retirement account. Yeah, that is 100% correct. So I'm not doing any of this trading myself. This is all being done automatically for me by the management team at NEOS. So they actually are the folks that pioneered covered call ETFs back in, I think it was 2015 or 16. I know they helped with like JEPI and XYLD and these other very popular covered call ETFs. And so they said, wait a second, all of these covered call ETFs that uh, are on the markets right now, you know, at the time it was very smart to do them this way, but we've realized there's a better way to do it. So let me explain this. There are three 
including SPYI, very popular covered call ETFs on the market. There is JEPI, JEPI, the JP Morgan Equity Premium ETF. It's got like tens of billions in AUM in it. AUM is? Assets under management. So think about it as people who are investing their money into this ETF like me or you, right? Um, That can be anyone around the world. Um, There's XYLD, which is the Global X Income ETF as well. And then there's SPYI. SPYI is a sort of triple win, in my opinion. I'll explain as to why, but to explain why it's a triple win, let me explain what JEPI and XYLD do wrong. JEPI, underlying, their underlying investment is not even in the S&P 500. Now, their benchmark is to track the total performance of the S&P 500, but they choose low beta stocks to keep it more and Can you explain smooth. what beta is? So, um, I, mean, I don't, like, don't know the Investopedia thing here, but an easy way to explain it is, in relation to the S&P 500, how much does a stock price move up or down in a standard deviation way away from the S&P 500? So in terms stock of just general volatility. Volatility, right? right. Yeah, the, that's uh, yeah, the beta is kind of going into that how extreme is a stock moving? Exactly, right? So I you know, I don't have the actual definition here for you, but an easy way to think about beta, how I think about beta is if it's a low beta, it's a low volatility. So it's not going to like Tesla's a high beta stock, right? It's always doing one of these. Yeah. JEPI, J E P I, this ETF that JP Morgan created, they wanted it to be the opposite. They wanted low beta stocks. And not only that, but they were going to do uh they they use a special, they don't even do the the right contracts. They use something called equity linked notes. Don't ask me exactly what that is, but <laughs> Essentially, it's a terrible way to do a covered call. Um, it, it makes it so all the income produced, you know, this the the four thousand fifty I made on Tesla, mm-hmm. you know, I have to pay ordinary income tax on that, right? That's real money I've been making. Jeppy does the exact same thing. So all the income produced with their ETF, they have to pay ordinary income tax on that. Mm. Well, if you're in retirement, that kind of sucks. Like I just, I don't like paying taxes in general. So that's the first loser with Jeppy is as they do that. The second loser is they have the low beta stocks that don't even follow the S and P 500. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's just the the two things there. And the third one is the total performance of Jeppy in 2023 was only nine percent. Mm. I'm sure people listening right now who are nerds like myself would know that the S&P 500 went up 26% in 2023. Mm. So you are leaving so much money, 17% on the table if you use this uh, ETF to generate your income. And that's a mistake a lot of people make because they don't know what they don't know. Sure. But uh, just to kind of highlight, because I want to make sure that the viewer understands this. Uh, with the covered call ETF, you know, you get the benefit like you're talking about of income, but it does come with risk too. It does come with risk. And and the risk of that is the underperformance against the S&P 500, right? If you chose JEPI as your covered call ETF of choice, well, congrats, you made a 9% total return in 2023, right? Like, like you, you made some money here. Um, but if you had just put your money in the S&P 500, you would have made 17% more. And that's the opportunity cost or the risk rather that, that people call out with these ETFs. And, you know, a lot, a big reason why they underperformed again was, you know, the Magnificent Seven. Mm-hmm. It's the, you know, these big seven technology names that are in the stock market here leading the S&P 500 in 2023. And now, yeah, recently in 2024 as well, um, Jeppy wanted nothing to do with them. Their fund manager said, ah, well, maybe have like Amazon and Microsoft, but we don't want the others. And so because of these low beta names, Jeppy just did not do very well. So that brings us to the second one that's very popular, which is XYLD. That's the Global X covered call S&P 500 ETF. Now, XYLD is doing things right. They're tracking the underlying assets of the S&P 500. Um, They have something called Section 1256 contracts, right? Mm -hmm. It's a form of an option contract, which is literally such a hack that people don't know about here. These Section 1256 contracts does not matter at all how long you hold the ETF. If you are producing income for your investors in this ETF, so these fund managers, right? They're making money for investors like me. All the money I make with this ETF 60% 60% of it is taxed as long-term capital gains and 40% is as short-term capital gains compared to Jeppy's 100% short-term capital and gains. short-term capital gains are higher taxes. Way higher, way so higher. So long-term capital gains essentially means that they pay 
lower tax rates Much on the lower. same amount of money. That's exactly right, which is why these Section 1256 contracts, I don't know why everyone doesn't use them. They are so, so OP, right? I mean, they're very cool. Um, so that's what XYLD does right, is they introduce these Section 1256 contracts. But what they do wrong, and this kind of comes back to our Tesla example here, is they write the covered call option contracts at the money. What does at the money mean? Remember when we talked about buying it at 260 mm -hmm. and having a strike price at 265? Mm -hmm. That $5 per share difference kind of baked in a guaranteed $500 profit for me mm -hmm. if I if if I ended up selling the stock to someone sure. else, right? So that $5 profit is my upside. Now it could go up to 270, 280, to whatever, but I have that guaranteed $500 profit. Mm -hmm. And so that is called out of the money. You are out of this 260 or up a little bit, right? That's, you know, I think it's what, 5% or so above mm -hmm. um, the the, uh, the purchase price. Now, what XYLD does wrong is they write them at the money, which means they're not baking in any upside potential. Um, and we all know there's a lot of upside in 2023 with the S&P 500, which is why XYLD only did, I think it was 12% total return, which brings us now to why I choose and live by SPYI as my income producing ETF, kind of come full circle now as to these income producing ETFs we like, SPYI. Not only are they using section 1256 contracts to have uh, better long-term better, uh, better tax rates, they're also uh, following the underlying S&P 500. So they're not doing the low beta stocks. They want all the ups and all the downs. And they're writing these covered call option contracts about up, you know, around four, five, six percent out of the money, which means when the S and P trades up, they also see that upside. They also are going to see some appreciation in, in price, which is why in 2023 the SPYI total return was 19 percent mm -hmm. compared to the 11 percent of XYLD and 9 percent of Jeppy. So outperform Jeppy by 2x and outperform XYLD uh, by what was that 7 percent? Now, sure, they didn't see the whole 26 percent that the SP uh, that the S&P 500 did, and that's because the option contracts, you know, uh, there if you write it at a specific dollar here and it goes beyond that, you do leave some upside sure. on the table, but you do get paid a 12 percent annual distribution yield. So my my goal here as an income focused investor is like, wait a second, if I can get half a million dollars, 600,000, 700, maybe call it a million dollars here into these income producing ETFs and they pay me 12, 13, 14% annual distribution yields, I could make 120, 130, $140,000 a year in my 30s or 40s. And I'm retired at that point. And that sure. money I'm making is taxed at a, at a tax advantage, 60% long-term capital gain. So for these people listening right now, the doctors, the engineers, the lawyers that are making a lot of money, and they're like, how do I make income with this mm -hmm. extra you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars? And they, they want to focus on income. SPYI is the best way, in my humble opinion, to do that. But I would also caution, you know, because there, again, the risk associated with that, you know, I'm not an option investor or sure. trader. Um, what would happen if the markets went down? So if the markets went down, what's really interesting about covered call ETFs is that they are always focused on generating a annual yield. And then that's the premium, right? That's what, uh, it's an income focused ETF. So if the markets, let's call it the S&P 500, because uh, that's what SPYI tracks. If the S&P 500 went down 12% mm -hmm. in 2024 and SPYI was able to generate 12% in yield or income distributions to their investors, then the total performance, you know, because the stock price would come down, but the um, you know, distribution paid out would kind of make up for it. The total performance in 24 for SPYI, if that happened, it would be zero. It, you know, because what you lose with the stock price, you'd get back with the distributions. With the yeah, with the income. Where with with the you know VOO or IVV, what you lose in the stock price, you only get about a two percent dividend yield there. So sure. you know, you're still in the red. Sure. So I guess one thing I always like to caution is to do your own research. Absolutely do right. your own research. I'm a guy on the internet and I'm again back to the, I'm sharing what I'm doing with my money. Yeah. And if it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and it, as anyone has questions on any of this stuff, I'd be happy. Uh, shoot me an email, austinhankwitz at gmail.com. I'd be happy to answer them or put you in the you know touch with folks who can. Yeah. So very cool. So we talked about a lot of different things. The last thing I want to talk about, which we kind of hinted at a few times is taxes. Uh, because I think you made it clear that you don't like paying taxes. I don't like paying taxes. Uh, why? I just, I think I could, 
if I really, really, really wanted to, I could probably have a better impact on my community and the people around me yeah. through services, physical goods, like whatever, like whatever people can do here with tax money than what the government can. Right. I, I, I'm not, um, I'm I'm not a big fan of of big government. I yeah. think that um, people should have you know free rights to do whatever they want, and and to me that's I'd rather pay less in taxes and be more on my own, um, not really have a lot of um, government subsidies or different types of like programs than um, you know someone who does pay a lot of taxes. However, the flip side of that is you know I've got a lot of people in my family, including my sister, who depends on the government. She's on social security. Uh, she's disabled mentally, and you know that is something that definitely helps her get by every month. Obviously, I support her as much as I can, so does my family. But you know, she is a benefactor of government subsidies that I pay into that I will never see um, any benefit from. So it's a you know it's a two sided edge there. But at the end of the day, um, I, I would rather have a little yeah. bit more money in my pocket to make an impact on my community and really see what my money is going towards. So, so you believe that you can take care of yourself better than the government could take care of you? Essentially, I would say so. Yeah. And where do you think that mindset shift? Happen because one thing that I, uh, we didn't touch on, but I always like to talk about, yeah. is the mindset side of becoming wealthy. Oh, yeah. And you started this journey in your early twenties, and I'm sure, and I don't know this, maybe you can tell me. Maybe in your teens, there was something that was brewing that kind of like sparked yeah. this. I mean, could you touch on that? And uh, what type of a uh, mindset shifts were needed in order for you to actually achieve the success that you're seeing now? I think the biggest mindset shift I made when I was in my teens, when I was in college, I've been a side hustler my whole life, right? Um, I had a t-shirt business in high school. I was doing some t-shirt stuff in college. Uh, I was cleaning car headlights. I was making there websites. Go, Dude, I was doing everything and I yeah. loved it, right? The mindset shift I made and it really, really, really helped me build my business today is that it is not a zero sum game. Mm. Me making money from someone somewhere in the world does not mean that you can't also make money from the same person. Mm. And the moment I realized that the world is not a zero sum game, we can all work together, we can all learn from each other and build upon each other's success to be better, that's when everything just started getting better. And so I think for people listening right now who might be a small business owner, a solopreneur like myself, is it's okay to, you know, get a little jealous so that people are doing well. Or might, like, it's okay to do that, but you have to realize that they're not taking your customers. They're not yeah. doing, like, they are doing their own thing. You know, maybe you might consider someone a competitor, but that kind of comes back to what, you know, Jeff Bezos, you know, his whole thing with Amazon is like, we relentlessly focus on the customer. Sure. We don't care at all about our competitors. And I think that is kind of, you know, the same, um, you know, it's it's a, it's a not a zero-sum game mindset. So like, yeah. I relentlessly focus on the best content possible, the best yeah. product I can sell. I try and be the best personality on podcasts, on this and that, that I can do, because I think over the long, run like it's gonna pay dividends and i don't have to say oh my gosh this minority mindset guy's taking all my subscribers on on uh on youtube and and i'm doing this and i gotta do this to do that it's like that's not the case man like it's okay for people to have cool stuff because you can have cool stuff too but i want to dive a little bit deeper into this because sure this is one of those things that i don't think people realize the importance of this and how hard it can really be so i'll, I'll put something in probably uh, I'm sure something you've been dealing with or you've sure. dealt with at some point because you're on the internet. There's a lot let's, of interesting people it. on the internet. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, as somebody who's a content creator in the financial space, you hear people saying, well, you're just a guy making money, teaching people about money. So if you're getting that type of criticism of doing this, right, how does somebody, and, and so somebody listening, it could be the whole spectrum of things, right? Because if you try to become wealthy, you're going to get criticism in one way, shape or form. Yeah. How do you get through those tough days? Because- I know you on the internet get that. How do you get through that? And what keeps you going? It's a good question. Um, and one, I agree that there are people on the internet that are making money who have, you know, who are selling a product to serve. I call them the fake gurus, 
who are selling a product, a service, or something here, a masterclass, who've never actually had a business or done anything themselves, but they've somehow figured out how to trick people to do that. Um, <laughs> I don't like that. And that's what that, definitely not what I try to be. You know, I do have my uh, ways that I make money as a content creator, but I also make money doing a lot of consulting, a lot of marketing, a lot of, um, you know, strategy work with, with other companies who are our customers, right? That have nothing to do with me being a, a creator. And that is the bulk of my business. So, um, but when I get that criticism and what keeps me going is, again, back to the mission, I want to make and introduce as many people as possible into the investor class. I think that's going to be the only way that we can meaningfully shrink the wealth gap in the United States is to get as many people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s to not just be consumers, but also owners, right? They don't just drink the Starbucks, they own stock in Starbucks. They don't just eat McDonald's, they own stock in McDonald's. They don't just shop at Costco, they own stock in Costco. Because once you make the mindset shift of, I'm not just a consumer, but I'm also an owner in the company, you then make the mindset shift of, wait a second, maybe I can start my own company. How did these people do it? How do I own equity in businesses? Because, I mean, we all see the, you know, what's Elon worth now? 250, 300 billion dollars? He doesn't have 300 billion dollars. Yeah, a lot. You know, and all these other billionaires, right? Mark Zuckerberg, right? They don't have $300 billion in cash. It's all on paper. It's all equity they own mm -hmm. in businesses. Now the business equity has value to it because the stock market assigns it value, but equity scales beyond time. Mm -hmm. And as a business owner and you own equity in businesses and including your own business, once you've been able to automate those processes and you know build employees and pro you know things of that nature, it will scale beyond you. And that's how generational wealth is built. I love that. And I think one of the things that I think you do really well is you you live by what you teach, right? You're making a lot of money and you are you share very openly about how you then take that money and reinvest it, right? You don't say, oh, I made a lot of money. Here's my Lambo. Yeah, Here's oh, my God, fancy dude. vacation. I, it's so funny. I drive a Forerunner. Um, I live in a $300,000 townhouse. Uh, my, my cool watch is a $200 Tissot. My girlfriend got me for our anniversary, <laughs> right? Um, I will say though, I, 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 I do like... Uh, pants some weird pants guy I like my peter millars i do like i get them hemmed <laughs> how much stuff. are those pants these are probably like 100 bucks 100, wow. 120 dollars pants now i get but i'm a pants guy I like yeah, okay. you know, that's no, why i switch cool. a little bit but um it's okay to splurge when you're making money as long as you can yeah, afford it right yeah it's uh, no lambos in, inside over here <laughs> but your home is worth almost as much as your tax well your tax bill is almost as much as your home right yeah well that's the thing too um what's really cool and you know i think that was a big step in my wealth building journey early on was buying my first property um, your first property was a your was, home to live in or? It, it, yes, it was a home to live in. And what happened, so I'll give you the whole story here. So the first house I bought, I think I was 23 or 24 years old. What happened was I moved to Nashville. I had a roommate. Uh, I was making my $3,800 a month after taxes. Um, you know, and I was trying to save money, pay off student loans, pay off credit card debt, you know, do all the normal stuff people are trying to do when they graduate college. And I'm scraping all my pennies together. I mean, I'm doing the budget stuff. It is really intense here. And then I get a letter in the mail from my landlord saying, hey, fellas, love y'all as tenants here. You know, y'all been paying 1700 bucks a month now uh, at, at this house. Um, we're raising the rent to 2500 Wow. Because, you know, Nashville's popping off at this point, right? That's so, a huge, that's like 50% increase. Dude, it sucked. Yeah, heck yeah. And I was like, holy crap, 2500 bucks a month? I was like, dude, we could have a mortgage for $2,500 a month mm. and like own the house. We don't have like, and he's like, yo, that's a good idea. <laughs> and he, he's like, you got money for a mortgage? And I was like, well, maybe. Like, let me let me look and let me see if I can like really and you were try working and, a job at this time? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was making my 63, 65 a year salary. Um, I, I, were you I, single? Uh, I was not single. I was not single. So I was definitely spending a little bit, you know, going out and doing, you know, stuff like that with, sure. with friends and girlfriend. But I was not single at the time. Um, but I was lucky enough to um, have a girlfriend at the time who did realize that I was super frugal and focused on investing in my money. She didn't, she didn't make fun of me for it, which is great. Um, but anyway, so fast forward to like, you know, these two months go by and I'm like, okay, here's a house. It's it's built brand new. It's a 2019. Uh, it's a townhome and they're selling it for $270,000. If I use this 3.5% FHA loan, I will only have to pay $10,455. I'll never forget that number. So I had to wire my last 10455 to uh, you know the the seller of this this house. It was a builder at the time. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the builder, um, you know, they handled the closing costs of like two or three thousand dollars there. Mm -hmm. And I 
owned real estate in Nashville for ten thousand four fifty five, and my mortgage was thirteen hundred bucks. Wow! So you're saving money, saving monthly. money, and owning equity in a in a, in a real estate um, you know uh, development that that's obviously in Nashville, Tennessee. So I was pumped, dude. That same house now is worth about four twenty. So I've paid down the mortgage from two seventy to about two fifty over that time. Okay. Um, so whatever the delta is there, call it about one hundred seventy thousand dollars in equity that has been added to my net worth because I was able to buy a house, uh, which was great. Uh, I, that now has turned into my rental property, and so, so you rent that out now. I do rent it out. And it what makes, what are you renting it for? Twenty one hundred. Twenty one hundred. So it covers all of your all the expenses. It. I, that's the thing. I'm never like trying to cash flow from it because I just want like, you know, it's always something that goes wrong in real estate. If it's a, you know, the dishwasher just broke at, at that house, actually, it's going to be like 900 bucks to fix. Right. So it's like, you know, one month of cash flow is really just something yeah. breaking in the future. So I don't think about it as like a cash flow income kind of um, vehicle. Interesting. Instead, I think about it as, you know, this is something that went up a hundred something thousand over the last four or five years. I'm sure, you know, it's 400 ish thousand right now. It'll be 500 by the end of the decade and maybe yeah. 600 by the time, um, you know, I'm, I'm ready to have kids and I can, you know, there's a bunch of really cool things I have plans for here. But um, yeah, dude, that was, I'd say the very first thing I did, the first money move, as people like to say, that helped me build my net worth was buying my first piece of real estate. And so now you rent that home out and you live somewhere else. I do. I live in another townhome in the same uh, community, actually. Oh, so your um, tenant is your neighbor. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. And they're really cool. Uh, but yeah, tenant's the neighbor. And uh, now I've got a uh, very similar townhome. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit nicer. Uh, we've painted it and renovated it. Yeah. But yeah, I you know I, I bought that place, um, I think it was like 380, 390. Yeah. Um, La, uh, I want to say 2022, and now it's probably worth the same 410, 420 as uh, as the other one is, and um, it's just a cool, modest place for me and my uh, girlfriend Island to live yeah. and hang out and and save money. And you know, we don't need to, to live downtown. We don't need to live in a mansion in Detroit, right? We don't need any of these crazy cool things. Um, I'm 27, dude. I'm trying to you know get as much money invested into the market so I can have a happy, healthy retirement. Well, there's a lot I think I want to unpack on that one because the first thing uh, going backwards is you said you don't need to mm -hmm. live in downtown Detroit or Tennessee, Nashville. Well, you might want to and okay. you can afford to. Yeah. So why not? You, you know, you're you not going to be 27 ever again. You're right. Oh my you gosh. Get, when you hit your 30s, the 20s are gone. That's true. Um, so, so why not get a really nice penthouse and you know enjoy that lifestyle while, while you're young enough to do that? That's a really good question. And um, the reason I don't is because, and the same reason I don't wear a Rolex or drive a Lambo is because I want to have, I want to retire first, right? And so mm. to retire to me means that I want to make sure that my future is locked in. All right, I've got the, you know, right now I think I've You're got- You're making good money, man. That's, it could all go away. I don't know. I, I just, I just, I just always want to make sure that like I've got- you know, and I you think, want to build your wealth first. Well, yeah, hundred percent, man. It kind of comes back to the conversation we're having, that where the difference is between men and women, right? I was talking to you know my friend about this too, and and he largely agrees. Is so women have, in my opinion, a emotional and um, time based shot clock around marriage, mm. kids, things, because for good reason, right? Like right. You know, Bio biology. biological reasons, absolutely yeah. understand that. Where men, on the other hand, their shot clock is more around money finances and making sure that like everything's set mm -hmm. because a guy, at least in my opinion, I'm a guy. Um, I don't want to bring someone into this world if I can't make sure that I'm set myself, right? I, I want to that. take care of myself, then I'll take care of my girlfriend. And then we'll, once we're good, we can then take care of our, our child and, and things of that nature. And so sort of that responsibility mindset is, is why I don't go out and spend X amount of tens of thousands on a yeah. mortgage downtown or whatever. It's like, I truly want to have the seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars invested into these covered call ETFs, dividend paying ETFs, single stocks, whatever I can do to say, okay, cool. Like like I'm now making six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month. That's pretty good. I'm good on that. Without you working, like yeah, without working, yeah. like just straight up passive income. Like that to me is way more than I need. And um, you know, now I've got my retirement as well. It's doing that stuff. Call it two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in these uh, 401k accounts. I'm 27. I can't touch that for uh, 35 years. In 35 years time, that'll be worth a couple million, I'm sure. So it's like, okay, that's good, and this is good. And I'm still making a lot of money. Okay, now we can have a little bit more fun. Yeah, like that, yeah. like, but I'm not at that point yet, right? I still want to be building my base, is sure. what I call it. And if I once I've got the base built, which for me is you know this around this a million or, or two rather. Um, for other people, it's that first hundred thousand sure. dollars we talked about before. Once the base is built, 
then I want to say, okay, now I'm 32. I'm still pretty young. I can still go do this, yeah, travel, yeah. do whatever. And, and that's going to be uh, the rationale there. Yeah. So you want to build the wealth, right? right? Make sure you have that net worth, the millions, the cash flow. Once you have this foundation built, now it's like, okay, I can now start to receive some of the dividends off of this. I call it a decade of sacrifice. You got to put in these 10 years. You live small, work to earn more, and invest as much money as possible. You get the raise, ignore the raise, keep investing it. Yep. That way now, when you pass through that threshold, now, okay, you built that foundation, you built that wealth, you own these assets, you have that equity, and it's paying you, for you, you're saying, you know, $6,000 a month. Now that's coming in, and if you still have a strong income, maybe you don't have to invest as aggressively. Yeah. Or maybe you can start using the dividends a little bit more, and now if you can, you know, keep increasing that from six to 10,000, now, maybe you do get that penthouse because, yeah, it's nice. Nothing wrong with having nice things. Right. You just want to have the wealth first. I exactly. love that. Exactly. So, and then the second thing I want to talk about with what you said, because one of the things I talk about a lot is real estate investing because it has been very powerful for me. Mm -hmm. But a big uh, hurdle, which is very understandable, is that first property, dealing with tenants, finding contractors, dealing with broken dishwashers, because yeah. it's a lot. Um, for somebody who is thinking about buying a property. Let's think about it this way. Would you recommend somebody buy a rental property first or their own home first? So we talk about this a lot actually on the Rich Habits podcast that I co-host with Robert. And I largely agree. It was his idea. And I'm not a real estate professional. He, he's owned dozens of properties throughout his life. He's 58 years old. Mm. Um, and so we have concluded that the best way to get started in real estate is to house hack. Right, that's to go buy the duplex, the triplex, the quadplex. Um, you know, get over your ego. You can live in a duplex, triplex, or quadplex. You'll be fine. You don't <laughs> need a beautiful single-family mansion. Go get one of these pieces of real estate. Use the Fannie Mae um, five percent down loan. Uh, they'll, they'll. I think it's up to one point two million that they'll lend you at just a five percent down. So it's just very close to my three and a half. I know that's it's different for every lender, but you know there's a loan out there that allows you to do it for five if you have good credit. And you buy the duplex. You live in one side. You rent out the other side. And hopefully that subsidizes a lot of the monthly mortgage because of your rent. Maybe it's a triplex, like whatever you want to do here. But that, I believe, is going to be the best way for anyone to get started in real estate because after you've lived in it for two, three, four, five years, you want to go finally get the townhouse or the single family home with your wife or girlfriend or whatever you want to have, yeah. have a family. You can then say, cool, I've got this tenant here and this tenant here. Mm -hmm. And combined, because I've been able to raise rents over the last five years, they are now offsetting the mortgage in mm -hmm. its entirety. And maybe I'm cash flowing a little bit. Um, beyond that, uh, I would argue that, you know, we know that rate cuts, you made a video about this on YouTube, uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, you know, rate cuts are around the corner, generally speaking, call it Q3 or Q4 this year. So uh, the Federal Reserve will likely uh, cut interest rates by fingers crossed, 75 basis points over the next 12, uh, 18 months. And once that transpires over the several you know, coming years now, I'm sure rates will continue to trend lower, allowing you to refinance the property, maybe even lower your mortgage uh, beyond that. And, and then maybe if even additional money on top of that, maybe you want to pay this off sooner. So maybe you take any additional cash flow after you have your reserves and you know uh, stuff for your rainy day fund within this real estate property, you're paying down aggressively on this house. So eventually, you know, you call it, call it 2,000 here and 2,000 here on the duplex and Maybe you were only cash flowing five or six hundred bucks before. Well, you pay it off, and now you're cash flowing four thousand dollars. Right? Yeah. That's crazy. That to me is like unbelievable. Um, and I'm sure you've experienced something similar with your real estate uh, ventures as well. But like, once these things are paid off, they cash flow like a bandit. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know what's interesting is, um, I think people in the Midwest. Uh, so I got started in real estate during the bottom of the 2008 crash. Nice. So, um, <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> no, thank you. But I, the reason why I say that is because um, I think people who kind of saw that, because I'm a little bit older than you, yeah. when uh, people saw the 2008 crash, people are, are naturally very like understanding of real estate prices can fall. Like they don't always go up. So like for me, I when I invest in real estate, it has to cash flow. I will not invest in real estate if it does not cash flow. But I've met a lot of investors, especially out of the Midwest, who feel very different where they'll buy property and it will lose money every month because their goal is, I bought this property for $300,000, i am going to sell it for three seventy five dollars in 12 months. Something along those lines. Yeah. Um, not even flippers where they'll put in a tenant and you know 
maybe they'll be break even or maybe they'll you know pay a couple hundred bucks a month just to you know make whatever tax bills mm-hmm. but to me that's a very dangerous game uh just because i remember the other side and so you got to pick the right game for you but for me you know because you're talking about how you're not too worried about the cash flow for me it's very different which i think now for somebody listening or watching this is you got to know the game you got to know your strategy because for me if it doesn't cash flow i won't invest in it um and i think that's something just important for anybody to understand is what is their strategy and understand how you're going to make money and understand the risks with that yeah because there's risks with whatever you do in real estate but you got to know your goal you got to know your strategy that way you know what your plan is 100%. And just to clarify too, the property that I do rent out, it does cash flow, right? But I don't realize any of that cash as as an owner. I don't put it in my personal checking account. It just, you know, stays in that separate account, builds upon itself and I only tap into it when something goes wrong or sure, you know yeah. stuff like that. So, I don't um, you know, I'm not like banking on it to pay my own mortgage or like, you know, pay my groceries for the month because uh that's, you know, unpredictable the things that might happen. I like the dishwasher breaking, right? But I couldn't agree more. I think that looking at real estate deals as someone who is still learning the process and, and still learning my own strategies in real estate, that ensuring that something does cash flow, incredibly important. So how did you get this mindset shift of, let's call it discipline, financial okay. discipline. Yeah. Was this something your parents beat into you as a kid? Or like, this is something like, you're 17, you're like, I'm going to be rich and I'm not going to spend money until I'm rich. Like, what, Dude, what caused Dude, that's so funny it? you say that because like, I did, like, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I, 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 I had the ego. I was making the 65 a year. Like, I was like, man, I, I got a cool job out of college. Like, let me go get a cool car. Right. Like I, I had the car payment here and there. Um, it, I was, but I would argue so weird to say this, the person who really like beat the, you don't need an ego, like get it out of your mind was Dave Ramsey. Shout out Dave. Shout out Dave. <laughs> but, um, dude, it really was him. Right. It's like, you know, you don't need to drive the $24,000 Lexus. You don't need to have the $500 car payment. You don't need to have these things because, and, and too, like obviously in college, of course, you are obsessed with the idea of every move you make, everything you post, everything you do online, people are going to see because everyone cares about you, right? No one cares about you. And then once you graduate and you realize you haven't talked to these people in a year, it's like, wait, maybe they didn't care about me. And then like two years go by, it's like, wait, I don't care about them either. And then it's like three years go by. It's like, why am I living my life, you know, for these people's acceptance? Like, I'm not going to, you know, try and stretch my, you know, money to try and have a cool car for people that don't even notice or care about me. Like, I'm. so what I did is I sold that car. Um, I went out and got a, I think it was $4,500, $5,000 I paid for a 2002 Lexus ES330 with 64,000 miles on it. And how much are you making then? Oh, the same 65, 70 ish. You're making 65 grand driving a $4,500 car. Yeah, man. That w- because I was paying, I think it was like $450, $500 a month on my car payment. And then an additional $200 on top of that for the insurance. Mm. So I get rid of the car payment. That goes away because I buy it in cash. That's $450 a month. Yeah. And then the car or the car insurance went from like $200 down to like $60. Wow. So another 150, 140. Dude, I was taken, man. I was feeling good. I was like, oh my gosh. And obviously uh, the girl I was dating at the time, she's like, I don't care what you drive. You can drive whatever you want. Like, wow. I don't, I'm not here for your car. So that was cool. Um, and now I drive whatever I want. So you got an extra $350 a month to put right into your investments or savings or paying down debt or whatever it is that you exactly, want. Exactly. Yes. And for me, that at the time was building up that initial 10, 455 to buy the, the house. And did you see like your friends kind of look at you sideways when you... Oh yeah, I did. I did. Cause I remember my friend, my best friend, Jacob, he's a lawyer here. Um, it's so funny. He was driving a like 2012, 2014, I think it was like a Kia Sorento or, you know, one of these like Kia sedans. Right. And he was like, dude, why did you just it's like, he's like, I drive a Kia and like, that's not the coolest car, but like, it's cooler than that thing. And I was like, <laughs> he's like, it's such a cool car. I was like, man, get out of here. Like, I'm just trying to like save yeah. my money and stuff. And so he's like, all right. And then he, he, he paid that car off. Um, and then he's like, nah, I'm just going to sell it. Now he drives a Jaguar. And of course he's got to look cool for the lawyer vibe. So he's of got course. a little payment on that. And then he's realized maybe I shouldn't have done that now a couple years later. So it's really cool though, to surround yourself by, you know, around people that also care about money in the way you do. Right. Um, if that's from the non-judgmental perspective of like, wait a second, we're all in our 20s. We're not rich. We're all just a couple guys or girls hanging out trying to have some fun. Like, I don't expect you to ball out of the bar. I don't expect you to drive a Lambo. Like, 
you know, just like you don't expect me to do, you know, the same things. Um, and I think that's kind of what happens by mistake is, you know, I, I've got a couple of friends, um, you know, my friend group that have opened up to me about their finances, considering, you know, much my personality online and they, you know, trust me with, with um, ideas and strategies and, and their numbers. And, you know, I hear from some of these guys that are making 130, 150,000 because they are engineers or they're lawyers or they're whatever. And they're carrying seven, eight, ten thousand $10,000 of credit card debt on their accounts because, you know, they want want to go get the bottle service. They want to go on the vacation. They want to go do these things that they see their friends doing. They see other people doing. They say, oh, I'm making money. I can do that too. And they realize, wait a second. I just got a tab for 2,800 bucks at this bar. That was a terrible idea. And then that, you know, yeah, dude, it's just, I, I luckily was able to leave all of that in like 2018, 2019. And ever since 2020, I'm like, dude, you can think whatever you want of me. Like I know what I am to me and the people that love me know what I am. So that's all that matters. So you just started to listen to Dave somehow and then that yeah. things clicked. Things really did. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is, you know, when when that clicks in your 20s, that is one of the best financial things that can happen to you. Um, because your 20s, I mean, this is the time where everybody's trying to figure things out. Yes. Yes. You know, people are trying to number one, make money. And number two, they're trying to figure out how to spend money. And on the making side, people go down one of two routes. Either I'm going to get a nice, comfortable job, and I'm going to try to work my way up, which is fine, right? Nothing wrong with that. Option number two is I can't work a job. I need to figure out how I can create my own income, and I'm trying to see how I can scale my own income. Then when it comes to spending, you also have two routes. Number one is I want to become wealthy, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to figure out whatever the heck that means. And maybe you come across Dave Ramsey or somebody on the internet that can help you with that. Or number two is... I'm finally making money. It's time to start showing it off. And I think those two decisions, right, of how I make money and how I spend money are so important because your 20s really set you up for the rest of your financial life. And not saying that if you don't do it right in your 20s, you can't correct it. But if you're listening to this video and you're in your 20s right now, understand that time is your most powerful tool that you have right now. And I mean, you're a prime example of that where if you can set that up in your 20s, you have the ability to reap the fruits of your labor for the rest of your life. You do. And, you know, like you're talking about, you want to retire in your 30s, like be done working. That gives you freedom Mm -hmm. and that gives you opportunities to do whatever it is that you want. And I think a lot of people miss that because we want to live and enjoy our 20s. YOLO, right? You only live once. That's a very just, I mean, that's just the trend. And don't get me wrong. If that's what you want to do and you like, I think a lot of people fake gurus, even personalities, whatever on the internet, make the mistake of thinking that everyone wants to be an entrepreneur or that everyone wants to like have a side hustle or do this or that. I think my girlfriend is a prime example of someone who's completely happy working her normal nine to five job. She wants to work, you know, whatever her job is for the rest of her career throughout retirement. Like, yeah, like she like there and there are so many people out there that are exactly that. They're like, yeah, I have every intention of graduating college getting a job and climbing the corporate ladder and, and, you know, going on my two vacations every year and working until I'm, you know, 60, 65, having a couple kids being like, I'm okay with being normal. And I love that. I want everyone to be happy doing whatever they want to do. Normal for me was not happiness. And so normal to me is, um, trying to figure out how I could best put my money to work to yeah. ensure that I can, you know, escape the rat race and sure. choose how I want to live my life day to day, not having to continually trade time for money. If it's, yeah. you know, doing this marketing consulting, if it's being a podcaster, a content creator, whatever it is, it's like, no, I can wake up and I don't know, go hang on my dad or I can yeah. go, you know, do something with my girlfriend or get some cool coffee or work out more. Right. So what does retirement look like for you? Like, let's say you hit <laughs> That's a good 35 question. years old, you got yeah. your two, $3 million in your investment accounts. They're paying you, let's just say $10,000 a month and you don't got to worry about money anymore. What does that look like for you? So I have a deep passion for fundamental analysis of stocks. That's the newsletter. That's a very interesting thing to have a passion it's, about. I'm so nerd. Dude, I'm such a nerd. Like people don't actually think about it, but like I'm such a nerd. They see me as like, you know, someone who can articulate some of this stuff as well as nerd out on it. But it's like, how do I spend most of my day like reading earnings analysis and like, it's, it's crazy nerd stuff, dude. But I would love to spend two, three, four hours a day, which is, um, I'd say 
probably, yeah, I'd say it's a pretty healthy um, amount every day on my newsletter, on just like getting out more content as it relates to personal finance and investing in the markets. There's a lot, you know, I'm launching a podcast with Morning Brew, um, if you know who they are here in the next couple months called After Earnings. And it's essentially uh, me and my friend Katy Perry, and we are going to be interviewing the CEOs of these publicly traded companies about their earnings and breaking it down for the layman. Like mm -hmm. show people like, wait, okay, Tesla did this or BarkBox that or whatever. You know, it's like, let's really understand what that means. And what are the yeah. drivers behind these numbers? And, you know, how, what does the future look like for the company, right? So I love nerding out on that stuff. And even in retirement is going to be me nerding out uh, with the newsletter, the podcast, yeah. just creating content that I'm a lot more passionate about and really makes me happy and fulfilled. Uh, the second thing I'd really want to prioritize is working out more. I used to work out all the time in high school and college. Yeah. Once I started working my nine to five, I didn't exactly have as much time or energy to do that, but I still kind of did it. But oh my God, dude. I have sacrificed so much of my health uh, from 2020 to 2024 building this business over the last four years now to get it to where it is, you know, long nights, early mornings, eating junk, energy drinks, everything along the way there. Um, and I want to change that in 24 and hopefully in 25 and then, you know, retirement and all the fun stuff there. So I would say a lot more time spending, um, you know, energy focus and uh, everything I could to make the best content relating to yeah. personal finance and investing, um, as well as working out a little bit more, spending more time with my dad. Uh, dude, weekends. Oh, I would love weekends back, man. <laughs> Not be able to work on the weekends and just like play Call of Duty or like, you know, go for a walk or something. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Yeah, I work a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that, yeah. Especially the early stages of entrepreneurship, it is it is a grind. Um, well, that's really the only thing you have against the against your competition, competition right? Yeah. Is the time that the extra time you spent in the early days to outwork your competition, and then obviously once you built out the processes, and yeah. the employees and stuff, then you rely on them to to continue to to build the business. But for all those people hustling right now, nothing wrong with it. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. I did it too, uh, but it's not something I want to do forever. So right now, let's say you're on pace for 35 to hit that retirement okay. number. Sure. Uh, if you had to, someone put a fire on you or put a gun to you and they said, you have to do this by 30. You have to cut it down in the next three and a half years uh, to hit that same 2 million. What would you do? What would you change in order to get there in the next three and a half years? That's such a good question. Well, obviously, I have to make more money. And so the only way I could do that would be to introduce new verticals into our business. Um I would probably start a podcast network and recruit three to five other podcasts into the network, introduce them to our advertisers, um, you know, build automations around them to monetize their audiences through digital downloads, email newsletter subscriptions, like whatever that looks like there. You're very familiar with that uh, business. Um, I, the, I, I think I, I, would, I would probably do that and that would generate probably an extra couple hundred thousand a year. Um, I would also... I would probably introduce a new, and I, something I've never done is I, I'm not a big believer in like the you know hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar courses that a lot of these gurus sell. Um, I believe that courses are great and people should have them because it is a easy shortcut to learning a topic that someone's an expert in. But I just am also a really big, uh, big believer in that information is free. Uh, everything you publish, I publish. Everyone else is publishing online is on YouTube and and you know newsletters and podcasts. Like just got to spend the time to find it. And so um, I'm a believer in that. But I might consider a master class or something. You know, gun to my head, fire in my butt. Gotta uh, you know make a lot of money really quick. I, I might have to figure out what that looks like. I know Alex Tramozzi just uh, started working with a platform called School. It's a really cool way to build a community, kind of like a Patreon. So maybe I, I create a, a school uh, community and, and can monetize that way. But I, I, I'm already pretty maxed out as it relates to uh, frugality and you know not spending money. Um, I, I, I'm really... How much money would you say you spend a month? Um, every single month, including the mortgage of the rental property, mm -hmm. um, I spend like money coming out of my account about six thousand. Wow! Now, when I get the money of that, and like you do, like the Delta cash flow, it's a little bit closer to like five thousand, right? Fifty two hundred. But uh, my mortgage for my house is twenty four fifty. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like half of what I spend there. And then the other 2,500 bucks a month, 2,600 bucks a month is, you know, groceries, um, utilities, eating out, just random normal things. And um, the other tens of thousands 
tens and tens of thousands of dollars going right back into your portfolio. Every that month. is right. Every single month. Yeah. Th uh, this month I invested $22,800. Um, and I think I might be able to get an extra couple thousand uh, invested by the end of the month. Next month should be a little bit closer to 30. So yeah, every month. And by the way, you know, our business, you know, we, we will do about a million this year. I do have a business partner. I pay him very handsomely. Yeah. So, you know, all this money I make, you know, a lot of it does go to him and, and other employers and expenses we have, right, too. So, um, you know, profit what i did last year is probably close to like 600 or so sure. 650,000 let me ask you a, maybe a little bit deeper question on the business cuz this yeah. is something that i had to go through um and it was a tough question for me to figure out which was when i started making more and more money um at first when i started making money it was i was making money buying rental properties making nice. money to buy rental properties that was it i wasn't making money kind of like what you were saying but when i was working to build my business my question then became why am I not investing my money into my own business? Mm -hmm. Because if you invest your money into your own business, you know, for, for me, when I invest in rental properties, I'm looking for a 7% cash on cash return. Totally. So for every 100 grand I invest, I'm looking for $7,000 of cash flow a year yeah. after expenses. Versus if I took the same 100 grand and I put it into the business, that could be zero or, or that could be, be a million. A, yeah, right? exactly. And, and so it comes with no risk. But then the question was, who would I rather bet on? And that was when, the decision for me that I started investing more into my business. So is that something you've thought about is investing that, you know, 22 grand into your business as opposed to your investments? And uh, if so, what are your thoughts on that? I think, um, so simple question is yes and no. Uh, we have been investing into the business more recently, specifically with the Rich Habits podcast. That was an investment we spent, uh, I think it was total $26,000 last year. Uh, building that from scratch. And I'm sure we're going to spend another probably 30,000 this year, like maintaining it and building it as well. Um, and, and, you know, that's um, recording software, that's editors, that's uh, social media managers, like, mm -hmm. you know, people like that. But I think a lot of people make the mistake of not knowing, including myself, like, I don't know sometimes how to invest that money back into my business, mm. right? It's like, I mean, my camera's cool. I just need to work harder. Like my, my microphones are all great. Like there's no equipment I can buy. Sure. I'm not, you know, there's maybe, and, and it's a lack of- So like, let me ask you this. If I gave you a check for $250,000 for your business today, ooh. do you think you could double your business revenue in six months? No, I don't. I do not think I could double the revenue in six months. Well, how about uh, 18 months? It would, it would be close. It'd be close. I think the first thing I would do, because as a creator, you know, you have to think about what scales. Sure. And we both know that newsletters scale very well and easily, right? You just have to write something. And then uh, the more readers you have, the more money you get paid, the more subscribers, like you just, you, you, same amount of time goes into it, but the upside potential is there. So if someone did have all that and they're like, here's, you know, spend it on whatever, I probably would go hire an analyst or a writer to help me make better newsletter content. I would switch probably from Substack to Beehive. I have no offense, Substack, but you guys are taking way too much of my money every month. <laughs> Dude, I'm paying 20% of my like month. Like it's crazy. Like, like this month we'll do like, I don't know, $12,000 of like revenue generated from sub, um, from the subscriptions. And like three grand of that goes to Substack. Like don't Ooh. get me wrong, but that's like, you know, it's $30,000 so $30, a year. They're managing your subscriptions? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Substack does the subscriptions. They Why do, don't you like, just use like a Stripe account and then manage your? Um... Good idea. That's what we're doing this year. It's oh, gonna okay. be uh, it's gonna be a big move. Uh, and Beehive is another uh, cool subscription manager that uh, helps us well, do that. So uh, I'll be doing that as well here very soon. But um, yeah, that's the thing. It's like I don't really know what would scale and automate parts of my business. I'm, I'm sure there there are parts that where it's like maybe there's someone that we could hire that would go out and find the best advertisers for Rich Habits or the best advertisers for our newsletter or even the best advertisers for me, like an agent sure. that, that can go out and and you know recruit people uh, or companies rather but you know i can only command so much money myself the rich habits can only command so much against the downloads uh news that i can only command so much against the readers and the open rates so in in the real part of our business comes from this growth marketing consulting and you know the only way we'd be able to double that was if i could you know clone myself and the knowledge i have and you know knowledge christian has so I've kind of pigeonholed myself and uh is in a there a way there. for you to scale your business so it doesn't necessarily rely just on you um parts of my business for sure uh, like the newsletter, sure. There are ways that I could scale that. Um, rich habits, I'm sure. Yeah, we could scale that to not rely on me. That's that's you know, maybe a, a podcast network we create and other yeah. you know podcasts we generate revenue on their behalf and then we get a cut of that. So there are certainly parts of the business that we could create that would rely nothing on myself. Um, 
that's the hard part about entrepreneurship, dude, it is, is replacing yourself. It's it's so tough, which is why the only way I know right now uh, that I can make money without me being involved at all is these covered call ETFs, I got the dividend investing. Yeah, and that's like yeah. what I know so well, right? Yeah. It's like, I don't know how to take that 20,000 and make it something even better in the business sure. that automates me out of the equation. I do know for a fact that I can choose the right investment vehicle uh, to make more money for me in perpetuity I into love the that. future. So kind of like, you just don't have an, because the reason why I said 250,000 is because, you know, based off of the numbers you told me, you'll clearly be investing 250,000 yeah. into your investments. Yeah. So, but what, what I'm hearing from you is, I don't know if, if a VC venture capitalist came to you with a blank check today, yeah. I just don't know where I'd put the money and money might just be wasted, which is interesting because that's actually what has happened with a lot of startups in the last few years where oh, yeah. it was just a game of raising money. That was the startup world. I'm kind of involved. Uh, I'm, been investing in startups Let's as well. talk about that. Sure. I've invested into 31 startups since uh, March of 2020, since I started all this stuff. Would lo I think, you know, startup investing is probably something uh, folks listening might be interested in. Like, walk me through your journey of startup investing and like how you find companies, what intrigues you, what do you look at, what is, you know, what is the perfect uh, scenario? Like, like what do you, what, what's about the founders you like? I mean, what's your kind of yeah. story there? So I'll tell you the mistakes because that's probably the easiest way to learn. So um, in terms of how do I find them, really any way possible. Now, kind of like you, I'm fortunate that um, I have a platform and an uh, audience. So many times people will just come to me right. um, through Same email here. or other kind of places like that. And then from there, it's one of the things I like to look for ideally is how I can potentially add value mm -hmm. besides just a check. Yes. Um, and so that means if there is something that I could potentially help with or promote it and kind of help provide exposure to grow the brand, that's going to ultimately help me in the back end as well. Right. So that's what I like to look for. Um, the mistake is for that I've, some of the biggest mistakes is working with companies that are too early. Mm. And so, and and looking at just the valuation game and, and kind of the pedigree game. By yeah. pedigree, I mean, oh, we have uh, interest by this company, this company, this VC, this VC. So it's like a it, they're just pitching their pedigree. And so like there was a company that I worked with, I don't remember the name. Uh, they were a kind of a legal tech company hmm. and I'm an attorney, a uh, licensed attorney. I don't work as an attorney, but I am a licensed attorney. So I've invested in a, a few different legal tech companies because of that. Well, one of the companies that I was investing in, this guy cold uh, emailed me and just kept emailing me and was showing some really cool value. And this guy on the phone seemed like a real go-getter. Like, yeah. you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Didn't really have much experience in the legal tech field, but had experience in uh, the the startup space. Sure. And the whole thing was, I would be one of the early partners or investors or whatever to this company. And we would uh, promote it initially to my audience, get some initial users, yep. and then we can use this as now money to go raise from other VC investors. And this was really earlier on in my uh, startup investing space. And it was exciting and the, it was cool. And I don't exactly remember what the product was. Um, this was, I don't know, it's been years ago now. It's probably 2019. Yeah. So it's been a long time. But it was something I remember being cool in the legal tech space that they were going to change the way that lawyers get paid and the way that uh, business owners get legal work. And I think they were catering primarily to creators, which yeah, is kind of yeah. the, the pitch to me. And so whatever, um, I was excited about it. We started to generate users. We, When I did the promotions, we got tons of uh, initial interest because it was a, such a cool product. But the problem was they didn't really have any other sort of funding secured mm. and they didn't have anything properly built. We were trying to uh, get users for their beta, their initial oh, testing. Oh, yeah. And then there was two or three founders. There was one main guy and then he had a couple other partners. They started to have some internal conflicts oh, I didn't gosh. know about. And so now we're starting to generate traction, trying to generate buzz, trying to generate initial users. They're having some internal conflicts. I don't know about it. And then the communication starts to go down and it's really, that's a very bad sign, especially in the early stages. Yeah. And uh, eventually I get a hold of them and they were like, you know, we couldn't solve some problems. We had different visions on the business, which was mm. very strange because the business hasn't even fully launched yet. Like right, we haven't made a dollar. Right. And so it ultimately just failed. But then it was really a big 
bad on me because I'm already promoting this. Right. I'm and all your one, followers you, are like, wait a second. I thought, you know, you had your stamp of approval on this. Exactly. Where'd it go? I'm already promoting this. I'm already talking about this. I am, I'm invested in this now. And now you're telling me that because of your mismanagement that this company is going to be shut down. And that was a big realization where like, okay, for me, if I want to invest in somebody, if you invest in an early stage company, like what angel investors do, which yeah. is the really early stage, you have the biggest potential upside but also the highest risk. Yep. And that was to me like that realization of, holy moly, that risk is definitely real, no matter if you know he had the pedigree, right? You got to, for me, I need to look at the product and I need to look at the traction of what they're actually building. And if they're in beta, that's okay, but understand that risk. So for me now, if I'm especially going to be working with somebody on the promotional side, they need to be a little bit beyond just where have an idea. Yeah. It's yeah. got to be a little bit further. And then the executives, I'll give you another example um, in the legal tech space, uh, a company that I invested in. It was a company that was similar where they created a, essentially a SaaS software as a service mm -hmm. between lawyers and uh, business owners. So if you're a business owner, you need an attorney. Uh, it's easier for you to find an attorney through the service and your, your fees are more contained. Sure. So it's beneficial for you as the business owner, but then for the lawyers, you also get to keep more of your money because you don't have to worry about your partner taking a big chunk of it and all the other like lower or higher attorneys taking a big chunk of your fees. So it's a way for attorneys to make more money and businesses to pay less money and get legal work. Got it. I invested in this company uh, because there was a lot of kind of switch ups happening and uh, a new CEO was brought on by the board who had this amazing pedigree of working with startups and taking them from one place to the other. To idea next. to IPO. Exactly. The dream. <laughs> well, the problem was um, the CEO was not vested in the business. She was involved in just like, this was her game that I'm going to work with a company for two years, two to three years, and I'm going to take it from, let's just say a $10 million valuation to a $100 million valuation, something along those lines. Mm. And that's her sweet spot. But she doesn't really care about the product. She doesn't care about the legal industry. doesn't care about the um, the space. And so when you have a rougher market, like we've seen in the last couple of years, absolutely, funding starts to dry, the interest in startups start to dry, and now you got to be able to face headwinds, yeah. which means you got to be able to make more sacrifices, make tougher decisions, be more innovative, which if you are not 110% committed to that industry, to that startup, to that product, it is not going to work. And that's what I realized again. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when I invest in startups, I am looking for people that are committed, people that care about the product and are really passionate about that space. And I want to see a product that has gone a little bit beyond ideally um, just the idea phase that it has to have some sort of, some sort of physical or tangible thing that you can see prove and, and totally. see some traction. Uh, I also, I'm a little bit more practical, but I also like to see the numbers make sense. Yeah. Um, because in, especially the fintech space, I've invested in companies before where, you know, it's all about the valuation. Oh, valuations always go up. Like yeah. Startups are just, oh my valuations are just going up like crazy. Versus now with the higher interest rate environment, you start to realize that doesn't matter. What people want to see is you are spending 10,000 and you're making 15,000. Exactly. Right? They want to see that margin. Exactly. And so looking at that profitability uh, metric. Maybe you don't have to be profitable today, but that clear path that we spend a dollar to make a dollar twenty-five, not spend a dollar to make eighty cents, exactly. which has been a big wave of startups in the last few years, especially. It's been really hard. I mean, you know, I've invested into thirty plus startups since twenty twenty, and I have the exact same sort of protocol. Um, however, whenever I work with a company like Public.com, for example, right? I started working with them back in the day. Um, and I realized like, wait a second, to your point, if I can provide additional value by um, introducing you to my audience or you know, having you do something where you, know, you get more users out of my investment, then um, that's great. That's the type of company I want to work for because I can have an outsized impact. Mm -hmm. And as a content creator, I know I'm never going to have a Mr. Beast or a Logan Paul like you know, product IPO. I mean, Prime has sold billions of bottles. You know, uh, what's well, it never called? say never. never. Yeah, maybe, right? Feastables has done, I think now, 100 some million dollars a year in revenue. They're crushing it, right? I don't think I'm going to have those opportunities. Um, so well, without, why do you say that? Ah, man, I just... Look, 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 look you're 27, okay? Let me tell maybe you you're right. Maybe you're, you're right. No, I, I'm telling you, you're 27 years old. You've already done what 99% of 27 year olds can't, right? You've already proven yourself that you have the ability. You've quit your job. 
you've made a business that's generating over a million dollars a year. Uh, you've built a six-figure portfolio, are on tech for a seven multi-seven-figure portfolio in your mid-30s. You've built a large audience, uh, over a million followers across your social brands. Now I see why you guys like this guy. I mean, there, there's... There's there's no reason why you can't right and and this we, you know, I've talked about the mindset right yeah because sometimes we are our biggest hurdles we are man and yeah it's hard maybe that's not your intention maybe that's not your goal it's definitely possible though I appreciate the kind words I really do and you know you look at people like Dave Ramsey for example who's you know four hundred million dollar year business right now just here in Nashville Tennessee thousands of employees um so yeah I mean there's definitely money to be made in the financial education space um however. I think that if I can have, um, you know, as a creator, I'm not going to have an IPO. A business I might create could have an IPO. But, um, you know, a lot of the outsized impact that I can have on these companies, if it's public or um, any any other company in the portfolio, right? Um, you know, and if I can see some of that upside alongside them with some sort of liquidity event, like I would love that. Mm. So I would say the best and brightest investment I made was in a company called Stan, S-T-A-N. It's a mm. Lincoln bio uh, solution, like a Beacons or a Linktree. Mm. It's Stan.store. Um, you know, I made friends with their uh, co-founder, John Hu, back in, I think it was December of 2020. Um, we were talking about this idea. He's like, man, I'm going to create a product. I, I love like, you know, the creator stuff here, but Beacons is limited. Linktree is limited. I want to make Shopify for content creators. I'll make it so easy for them to sell digital downloads, have email magnets, you know, uh, even have like a Calendly built, built into their bio and like all these other different like, courses, everything, uh, email flows, automations, everything that instead of a, a big tech stack that creators have to use, mm. they can just go and use Stan. And it's going to be 29 bucks a month or 99 bucks a month, whatever it is. And it's going to be great. And I was like, dude, sign me up. Like, I'll write you a check. Like, this is great. I love this idea. Um, I, I'll introduce it to all my creator friends. They can all start using Stan. I'll use Stan. We can give you feedback. Like, you can do your thing. Um, he went from idea to now seven. Uh, how much did you invest? $75,000. Wow. It, uh, the second largest check I ever wrote. <laughs> and this is a guy, however, that um, went to Stanford. He uh, worked at Goldman Sachs Investment Banking out of college. He worked for Norwest uh, Venture Partners uh, in California. So he understood. I mean, this guy was straight as an arrow. He's very, very intelligent. Um, and I believed in him. And I still believe in him. He's one of my mm -hmm. best friends. And so I was like, dude, I want to write you this check and I want to help any way I can. Um, and now that company went from zero in uh, you know annual recurring revenue to uh, 17 million by the end of 2023. And they're on track to um, hopefully, fingers crossed, do between 35 and 45 million by Exciting. the end of this year. Amazing. And you know, you put a six, eight, maybe 10x multiple on that. And you're now at, a, you know, I got in at the, I think it was a, a $25 million valuation, $20 million valuation. Um, even with their numbers right now, I, I'd argue 100, 150 million. And hopefully by the end of the year, much closer to $250, $300 million valuation, which would be very cool. Uh, obviously, it's all paper, right? None of this really matters here. But, um, you know, it, it's just really, really exciting to see, to your point, you know, these startups that do work out. Now, to your point as well, I have had, I've also written a $75,000 check to a company that went to zero and is a nothing. And it, no one knows about them because they yeah. never got off the ground and it was a terrible idea. Um, but that, I think, is also part of the, the game, right? I, I've made mistakes, um, but I'm super fortunate to have learned that this mistake exists at 27 years old. So when I'm 37, 47, 57, um, I can make better decisions. And hopefully I can make the mistakes for all the other 20, 30, 40 something year olds listening yeah. right now that are like, oh wait, I want to do it, you know, a stuff. That's not yeah. no, you know, wait a second. Let, <laughs> learn from these guys, right? Yeah. We're just Yeah. I mean, one thing that I've learned is understanding which part of my portfolio is speculative yes. and which part is not. Like the way that I do it, and I don't recommend what I do to anybody, is uh, about 18% of my portfolio, investment portfolio is speculative assets. Okay, That's my startups, that's crypto. If I find another fun investment, I'll, that I understand that that's, that's where that is. Sure. Um, if it goes to zero, okay. If it makes a lot of money, okay. Like, you know, it's one of those things where it's kind of a fun investment, but the yeah. bulk, 80% um, is is my real estate and stocks. And the majority of the AD is real estate because that's something I understand. So I think, you know, for someone starting off as an investor, you got to test the waters, see what you like. You, you know, I, that's why I never say you have to invest in real estate. You have to invest in stocks. You have to, you got to figure out what you like. People have become millionaires in the real estate market without ever touching stocks. Yeah. People have become millionaires in the stock market without ever touching real estate. Some people have become millionaires investing only in startups. Like, 
you just got to find what's right for you. 100%. Um, and test the waters and then understand, you know, what you know and leverage your knowledge to build the best investments. But then also understand when you don't understand something, that's a bit more speculative. And your speculative parts of your investments should be a speculative piece of your portfolio. It should. Not the bulk of a portfolio, which is why, you know, when you have people dumping their portfolios into speculative risk, uh, cryptos or Did meme stocks. Did you watch the uh, This Is Not Financial Advice documentary? No. Everyone should go check out This Is Not Financial Advice. It's a documentary um, that Opt, uh, Optimist, I think, is the name of the company. Um, but they did a documentary on the Dogecoin millionaire. Mm. And they followed him around throughout that, what was that, 2021 time uh, when Dogecoin went from like nothing to 70 cents or something. And they, they it was a, a documentary on, uh, his name is Pro, is what he goes by Pro, and how he maxed out all his credit cards, took out all these loans to get $180,000. Oh my God, I'm getting stressed while I'm just hearing this, man. Oh, dude, it was crazy. And, you know, he's this guy living in a one bedroom apartment in California. He has no money to his name. He's like, it just, but he's, he took out all this debt and he went and got all this Dogecoin, wrote it all the way up to $3 million. Did he sell? Please tell me he sold. He wrote it all the way down to 50 grand. Oh my God. I can't watch this. I want to get a heart attack. Dude, it was, it's a really good documentary though because they, what's interesting about it is they have four different personalities that they kind of follow uh, around during this time. And, you know, Graham's in it. Jack is in it. Andre Jick is in it. These other, you know, Tejas Halur is in it. Uh, Genevieve uh, is in it. So a lot of like really cool people um, to add additional color. Josh Brown is in it uh, from the Compounded Friends. So a lot of awesome people to, to learn from, but it shows like, on, you know, during the same time that one guy is going into crazy debt to have a crazy speculative idea that didn't work out, there's another guy that's saying, nah, man, I'm, I'm buying the dividend stocks. I'm, I'm staying it's, you know, yeah. steadfast on my, my normal stuff here. And it's, uh, it's just, it puts a lot in perspective into your point about being speculative and, and having, you know, I call it the core and the satellites. So mm -hmm. my core portfolio is 70% index funds, mm -hmm. real estate, things that have for the last hundred years gone up into the right. And I would assume over the next hundred years will continue to go up into the right. Mm -hmm. That's the core. The other 30% are the little bit more aggressive investment ideas. They're not um, speculative in the fact that it's a gamble, right? I'm not gambling on Dogecoin, but you know, buying a single stock is pretty speculative in nature, right? Buying Tesla stock is speculative. Buying, you know, cybersecurity names like Palo Alto Networks or uh, CrowdStrike, those are pretty yeah. um speculative in nature. And so my single stock investments and my cryptocurrency and uh, you know things of that nature do make up about 30% of my invested assets as well. But um, you know it's from a place of education. It's from yeah. a place of research. And it's from a place of knowing, to your point as well, if it goes to zero, then okay. I mean, I'm 27 and it's, yeah. it's not the majority. It's not the big thing. Yeah. I think that's the education that's so important. Like I was, uh, I was getting my I went to the oil change spot for my car a little bit ago and I know the mechanics there pretty well. And I was talking to one of the guys and he was like, yo, you make YouTube videos, right? I was like, yeah. He said, you know, um, I got involved in investing a little bit. Um, he's like, I put a little bit of money into uh, the stock market, bought some stock, it didn't really go anywhere, but I put like a couple hundred bucks into this crypto and that went up to $600, man. He's like, so I'm just kind of, you know, watching that. And, and uh, as I'm hearing him talk, you know, I'm realizing like, he just kind of just threw the money in because that's where the hype was. Yeah. And now he's waiting for the markets to just go up even more. And it's like, man, like you, you work a job, you're making okay money, but eventually you're going to want to stop working. Yep. Eventually you're going to want to retire. And how are you going to do that? You need some sort of assets that are going to be there and just dumping it into whatever the media is talking about, whatever, you know, there's the hypey thing, whether it's stocks, crypto, it does not matter. Without some sort of fundamental asset, some sort of like, you know, true value that you're investing in, it becomes very difficult and very risky. And uh, I think that's that important part of the financial education that, you know, I, I hear you talking about, and then I hear you trying to spread, you know, making people into investors, owners, because you can only work for so long. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with working. You work. I right? love to work. Entrepreneurs work. You're yep. an owner of the business, but you still work. Nothing wrong with working, whether you, it's your own company or somebody else's company. But the question is now, what do you do with that money? And that's the financial education, man, that I really appreciate, uh, you know, you sitting down with me in Nashville talking about this. Uh, where can people learn more about you, find you, and keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, no, I'm right there with you, man. I think at the end of the day, we need to get as many people as possible to just know that and realize that you can't trade time for money for the rest of your life. You have to put money away and invest it into what, you know, we talked about earlier, equity in businesses because yeah. they, they go up and they scale uh, beyond just yourself. Um, so yes, be an owner. Don't be just a consumer. 
If you want to learn more about um, you know the anything I do, obviously you can uh, email me austinhankwitz at gmail.com. I get back to all my emails. I'm really personable that way. Uh, I've got a podcast called Rich Habits Podcast. Uh, we are a top ten business podcast right now on Spotify. I have a newsletter on Substack called Rate of Return, uh, where we talk about everything that goes on in the markets that week, as well as everything that's uh, to be expected. Uh, this is where you can find my two million dollar dividend growth portfolio, everything I'm invested into just everything I'm doing that way. Um, And if you have any questions, ideas, comments, concerns, email me. I really want to hear from these people and see, you know, what they're focused on and uh, just want to provide value any way I can. Well, Austin, thank you for coming on, man. It was a good time. So much fun. Thank Thank you you. so much for having me. Over $150,000, you would have to carry forward the losses each year until you sell the asset. Okay. Now, the real estate professional is someone like, let's call it Donald Trump. He was able to tap into, I believe it was like a nine million or nine, 